Okay. We are doing an interview with Mr. David Nensel. Today is the 25th of June, 1990. Mr. Nensel is right now a tourist in Israel. He was born in uh, Ripin, Poland in 1916. Then he was in Ghetto Makov and in Ghetto Mlava. He was transported to Auschwitz-Birkenau in December 42. Then there he was almost or more than two years until January 45. In January 45, he went on a death march to Mauthausen and from there to Ebenze. There he was liberated on May 45. Okay, I have some mistakes. <laughs> you have more experience than I have. <laughs> I don't know. Mr. Nensel, until what year uh, you were in uh, Ripin, where you were born? Oh, uh, to 19... Oh, like, I went to the army, to the Polish army, and, and I was in, in Turin. Mm -hmm. uh, I was placed in a uh, outfit that uh, the anti-aircraft anti outfit and the whole group in the whole company was for Jews only they never had Jews in that type of service um, so uh, this was 1936 or, or or the middle of 1936, uh, I was two years in the army, so in between, I was home, and uh, but before 1936, um, from 1933 to 36, 37, we felt the German uh, propaganda there in Poland. Uh, all the anti-Semitic uh, happenings, what happened uh, in Poland before the war, I knew, I remember them. Uh, an example, let's say, uh, the ritual slaughtering of uh, animals in the Jewish way, they, they took uh, action to eliminate it. Should I talk about it? Yes, sir. And uh, uh, so every time in the Polish papers, and they had a campaign for it, they said that this and this block from this and this town signed up to eliminate the uh, rituals uh, slaughter. Uh, it came to a point, uh, let's say, that uh, from the town that Every time they used to do the ritual slaughters where Jews were, they eliminated and they gave, let's say, a central point where where it has to be done. So to make it harder, the traveling and the transportation, they made it harder for the Jewish people. Now, the the picketing of Jewish uh, stores, uh, they had. Uh, pickets around every Jewish establishment. You are speaking about a specific case in your town? My town, yes. In Ripin? Ripin. And I'm sure that's uh, possible it was in a lot of towns, the same approach. Now the pickets was daily. And if any non-Jew went into a Jewish establishment, that person was denounced on Sunday in ch at church that they went in to buy at the Jewish place. It became so bad for the uh, merchants that jokingly, the joke was uh, that the one merchant said to the pickets, how much do you get a day? Uh, give me the money and I'll close up and you wouldn't have to pick it. Uh -huh. So that's how far it came. And I remember one thing that the Jewish community 
it was a cultural organized community. We were nice library in the Maccabee. We had a Hebrew school built ourselves, the Tarbut. Uh, we had uh, the sport organizations, the Maccabee had a, a 50 pieces brass band, which were all from the community. As myself, I was playing on a trumpet and the, and the Maccabee. Uh, a lovely community life from 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 all kind of orthodox and non orthodox and uh, uh, cultural things they made some evenings of concerts and other things and I remember at one night coming out from a concert we were attacked by the hooligans uh, and too bad that up to now a friend of mine, a non-Jewish friend, I found him in the group that there was attacking. I will never forgive him. I don't know where he is now after the war, but it's in my mind. The relationship before the thing started it wasn't too bad, but the uh, propaganda was coming in very strong and all kind of problems. Um, they accused the Jews belonging to all kind of uh, subversive organizations and um, I remember that they brought to court a prominent Jew with a long beard, a chassid, and they came before the judge and he asked him, to what organization do you belong? Do you belong to this and this organization? And the man, the Jewish man answered, I belong to one <coughs> organization, to Abraham, Yitzchak, and Jacob. And mm -hmm. I remember this was an answer, but he still, I think, was indicted for, for no reason anyway. This was going on, and later on I went to the army, I was drafted to the army, and when I came in in a company that was no Jews before, I knew that I have to do better than somebody else. And uh, I did conduct myself uh, to be uh, without any blemishes, really. Perfect. Perfect, right. <laughs> and I remember that the sergeant took me aside once. This is a non Jew. And he says, You know, we didn't have, he said it, we didn't have Jews before. And you know that you have to do it right. I, uh, that's what he said to me, but I felt myself that I have to do better than somebody else. Anyway, at the end of the service, I supposed to go home already, and the the, the way of and and uh, Poland that you finish the service, you go home, you prepare a civilian suit. You always on in the uniform. You never change like in other countries, like I'm in the United States, or maybe in Israel too. The soldiers change to their civilian clothes. And in uh, Poland, you had to wear the uniform constantly when you were in the army. So before, the libera before f uh, ending the, the um, service, uh, I went home already and I prepared the uh, 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 a civilian suit, and the war broke out in 1939. Mm -hmm. What about your family uh, during this time? You mm -hmm. have one brother or more? No, we were nine children. Mm -hmm. And we were left after the war, we were left four. The parents, three sisters, went to Auschwitz and two brothers died in Russia. They, when the Germans came in, they ran, they ran towards uh, the uh, Bialystok, mm -hmm. Lamja. Uh, th th that's where the Germans weren't in, in 1940. They, uh, they made a pact with Hitler at that time, Russia. They took part of Poland, and part of Poland's were Ripian like Ripian, Sherbs, Torim, Brodica, Plotsk was uh, incorporated to the Deutsches Reich. Yes. 
and uh, the other other parts uh, was uh, under Russia. So if they were running towards that direction. And um, you my were, your family were religious. Yes, they they were. They were. Uh, we had a religious education, really. Uh, uh, my parents didn't care, or it's uh, orthodox, or it's non-orthodox. Where they could get good education, a good hater, uh, that's where we went. But uh, I remember they were they were religious. Came Saturday, we observed the Shabbat. My mother always sitting a whole day and re reading the the Trina. I don't know what it is, a book, the, you know, all the prayer books and the stories and other things. Yes, we grew up in a, a, a uh, traditional Orthodox. traditional traditional, but uh, fearful religious people. Um, and you were the oldest brother? Or no, no, my, we were, like I said before, we were nine children. My, the older, the oldest was my sister, which uh, she survived and she is in uh, Florida also, where I live. And my younger brother, uh, my uh, two younger brothers, um, Ruben and Isaac, they perished in Russia. They got sick and uh, there was no sickness there. They just, they just they didn't make true. And my younger brother, Avram, which is now in, in uh, uh, now we came in 1943 in Israel with uh, Yalda Tehran from the children that they took out yeah, Polish they children yes. and they brought Tehran them to children. Tehran children. So in 1943 he came to Palestine that time, but he, he knew uh, Evrit from Tarbut. From so school. From the school. Yes. We, we went to public school and now Tarbut was accredited uh, public school. Now myself, I had to go to uh, First, in the, in the morning to public school, and after I came home from public school, I went to Cheder. So my whole day was like taking uh, with the, uh, being with the uh, education. Mm -hmm. uh, I, after after public school, I, the Cheder took about to uh, uh, four or five o'clock in the evening. Until uh, we grew up, uh, and we were a very close family. My parents worked very hard. They gave the best education that was possible. Work? Hmm? What was their work? The work that my my uh, father uh, dealt with meat and uh, exporting meat and mm -hmm. supplying meat to the uh, hospitals, uh, old age homes, uh, uh, children homes. Uh, he dealt mostly with the uh, Polish landowners. Um, we exported to uh, Germany cattle, you know, from Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the war broke out, I was in the army and, it's, and uh, the first thrust of power from the German army, we got it. And uh, after fighting before war, war so before they when ruined When you were in the army, you were the, when the Germans attacked, or you were at home? No, no, I was in the army. You were in the army. Yes. What uh, task you have in the army? Uh, Anti-aircraft. I was at the uh, 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 gun, the anti-aircraft -air gun, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a pretty close call. Like it's cannons, not guns. Cannons. You mean yeah, cannons, right. Totochim. Yeah, cannons, cannons, yes. Mm. Can we, you were shooting today. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where you were sitting as a soldier in this time? Near Varsha? No, near Kutna. Uh -huh. Kutna was a key, uh, 
a key railroad key that junction you mean? yes a junction right mm -hmm. and uh, every every two kilometers was, uh, there were two guns and was protecting the the, the railroad station mm -hmm. that was the main things and later on we were sent away from Kutna and that's the time we got engaged a very powerful uh, uh, German unit and how I came out from there I don't know myself don't ask me uh, two uh, two uh, soldiers right next to me they got shot killed and and in and, and the trucks and uh, how I came out for it I, I really don't know I can account for it really so this was in the wartime and after that happening, we Just were... Just a moment, as you were a soldier, it, as it was a surprise, the German attack was a surprise to the Polish army. Yes, uh, yeah, they just uh, walked in, right. And so uh, we... I mean, this day of the attack, maybe more detailed. 19, 1939, in September, I think. Yes, but I mean, personally, personally, if you remember details... Personally, details, day. I'll tell you frankly, I was in the Polish army, and when <laughs> we were fighting... I didn't feel I didn't feel that I fight for Poland. I felt that I'm fighting the Nazis. I'm fighting what they're doing to the Jewish people. That's what I'm fighting for. When I was in the hardest spot, I I I, I thought about the the best. It's the Nazis. What they're doing they, with all the laws that they made before the war. That's what I had in mind. In Germany, they made. In Germany, it. yes. Mm -hmm. I really, frankly speaking, uh, I didn't think that I'm fighting for Poland. I I felt that I'm fighting against Nazism. Mm -hmm. And uh, right after the uh, engagement, but we were there. Uh, it took maybe uh, another week, maybe, and we surrendered. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into military things, which is, uh, uh, but well, it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. It's important. Yeah. Oh, uh, from that, from. I mean, only f I mean, only from your personal memoir. Yes, I know from my personal memoir, and I'm not trying uh, uh, personal happenings, which has no value for historical things, you know. I think it does. Yeah, so the, 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 main, the main thing... It does have a value. Hmm? It does have a value. It does have a value? Yes, unless you like don't have to give a testimony. I mean, we know that the Germans attacked Poland in 39. Right. Okay, so I was taken, I was taken as, a, as a war prisoner after that first... So what thing. happened to you? Yes, Just yes to, that's what I'm going to... Yes, yeah. uh, I was taken as a war prisoner and I remember I had a little sitter prayer book with me, a small one. And uh, uh, I threw it away that time. I know that if they find it in the it's end, your Jewish. yes. Uh -huh. So I I threw it away that time. I threw away this little cedar, they were very small ones. Uh, I think you still can buy them today, very little ones. Yes, like this. Yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, that time I threw it away. And uh, they marched us for a whole day and they brought us in to a, it was a school and fenced in yes. and uh, there was no place in the in the building there was no place to stand that's how many prisoners and all the uh, uh, hygienic thing all these uh, uh, bathrooms and the other things it was terrible from from thousands of people there so the best place was on the outside. It was near what city? Uh, this I wouldn't know. They marched us a whole day and we came in and practically in the evening. But you were captured well? Captured uh, near Ilova mm -hmm. from Kutna. Uh, it was all kind of skirmishes around uh, uh, there. And, and uh, our guns could uh, uh, fire at the uh, infantry also. Yes. So they send us there uh, to clear up something, but it was not to clear up. They were well entrenched there. Mm 
<coughs> our intelligence was zero. We, we, we came, we walked in in a trap. Ours was mechanized. And the most of the Polish army was horse and wagon and other things. But we were mechanized. And uh, I'm going back now to uh, near Lova. And the officer gave an order to go into a side road. And the side road, you couldn't turn around. If you want to turn around, you couldn't turn around. It's just on a side road. So he put up the whole uh, equipment, really, like on a firing range. Later on, we realized that the Germans they were behind uh, uh, a railroad track. And finally, we tried to attack. We got the order to attack. They noticed that Germans are there. So we started to fire, and they returned the fire. So we saw that we were trapped, and the order was to pull out. So to pull out, so you figure you jump into the truck, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the easiest thing. You're going to go. So I jumped into a truck and was a truck with ammunition. Mm -hmm. And the first thing what they did, they punctured all the tires on the, on the trucks. Mm -hmm. And they shot into the motors and they were burning. And two fellows next to me, uh, they said, oh, oh, oh Jesus, and they, they got killed. And I figured as long as I didn't get hurt, I'm going to stay that way. I'm not going to move. But uh, uh, quiet down a little bit, and I pushed myself off the truck like you push, you, you drop a bundle, like you drop a bundle. You don't, I, with my foot, I just pushed myself and I fell to the ground. Now, when I fell to the ground, I saw most of the people from our group, they were, they were running. They were already far away from me. Mm -hmm. And I tried to catch up. And usually, uh, you are trained in the Army. You don't go a straight line. You go zigzag, you know. And, and you fall down, you get up, you fall down, you get up. Finally, I got so tired. And I said to myself, I don't care what, I'm just going to walk straight, let him shoot. I didn't have the strength already to, to fall down and go up and down. And uh, I finally I caught up with them. And right after, after that, it didn't take, uh, it took a few days and uh, we gave up. I remember uh, we were in a small farm house and we tore down the curtains, the white curtains from the window, and we put it up on a stick. And our group, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the white flag, a white flag, mm -hmm. yes. And we were possible over twenty from our group that you got together like that. Mm -hmm. And that's the time I was taken as a prisoner. And they walked me for I say for a whole day, and I came to that place. There was no place where to stand in the building, and, and it's September, and it's cool, cold there. And uh, so you lay down on the ground, the, uh, uh, and that time I really, I really got sick after that thing. The body was heated, steamed up from a whole day walking in the wet grounds. It didn't do me any good. And I had a little, uh, a little uh, hand, like I had a large handbag, which you was carry as a soldier. I don't know if it's a handbag, what do you call that? Rukazak? Yeah, something like, you know. And uh, I had a little ration day and everything. I put it under my head and I lay down to sleep. When I woke up, that thing was gone. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, somebody took it and uh, possibly everybody was looking for something to, to eat. And I woke up, and I started walking around. I couldn't sleep. And uh, the German soldier asked me, at that time, 
my German wasn't too bad. We had in high school, and I mean public school, we had the German as a, a language we took up. So when I spoke, he asked me, what are you doing? I say, in German, I can't sleep. So he, he says to me, follow me. And um, you have to separate the Wehrmacht from the SS, mm -hmm. you know, the regular soldiers. And they, he took, he says, come with me. And, and, and I followed him. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the, all the fellows saw that uh, I'm going with him, they start following me. And he opened up a, a little room that was uh, with co not called turf, they used to call that. That from the ground they used to press together and they used to use it for burning material in Europe at that time. Mm -hmm. Instead and of coal. It's like coal. Instead just of coal, it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he opened up the, that little room and he says, go in here. So I was the first one. You can imagine that's not even. And they all pushed in and I was laying on the, on the uneven thing. I woke up in the morning. That, that's what I say. I don't want to go into the small little details, which it... Uh, it why? I don't, okay, if you say why, I'm not going to say it anymore. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep on talking. From there, they took us to... Uh, Sheratz. Sheratz is near Lodz, and this was a, a town with a big prison built before the war. Mm -hmm. Sheratz, most of political, I think, uh, uh, p no, political people, I think Poland mm -hmm. put him there too. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we were there for a short time, separate, Jewish blocks. Separate. So the, new, the German know already that you are well, Jewish. Sure, right. That's so you have to imagine that POWs, which uh, under the Gen Geneva Conference, uh -huh. it's a POW. It doesn't make a difference. But that time they separated already. How did they check if you are Jewish or not? They, they <coughs> just asked and then we said it. Ah, you admit? Admit, right. Uh, how many Jews? I mean, it was many? That time it was, uh, um, yeah, a few hundred. Mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the blocks they got together from all the prisoners and from there they transport us, uh, this transport us to, uh, to uh, Germany and I came to a camp um, before the war it used to be a German military camp I think it's Alten Grabov Alten, Alten, Alten Grabov if you ask me how to spell it I can try, but that's that's what it sounds. Alten, Alten Grabov, mm -hmm. and uh, um, from there, I was there uh, for a few, uh, few months. They kept us there, and with all the registrations with, with other things, and they put us in separate blocks also. And we were abused as POWs there in Germany. Wow. They kicked us within, you know, all kinds of things for no reason. You ask a question, why or how? 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 You, you got kicked and all kinds of things. The thing by itself as a POW to be in a separate barrack, which is not right. But it seems they didn't care. Uh, the Polish the, prisoners also were like this? Or and separate, separate, not with the Jewish prisoners. I mean, they were treated... Oh, no, 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 no. And uh, this is Alton Grabov, I think, I don't know where it is, but I think it's not far from Magdeburg or somewhere. I, 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 in Germany? In Germany. I, I, I really don't know. Uh, uh, or Regensburg or Magdeburg, I really don't know. And anyway, from there they send us uh, out uh, for, uh, to work at the Steinbruch. Yeah. Steinbruch is the uh, pit. Uh, yeah, stone cutting uh, pit. Yeah. Like uh, digging and breaking stone. Or right. Like they used it for the for the roads. <coughs> they yeah. used it, and we were we were quartered. Uh, uh, we were sleeping on the top of a, a, a top of a bar and I remember that there was a picture of Hitler in that room 
it was another group also in the same, that they were sleeping <coughs> separately. Mm -hmm. It was a Polish POW group. They were working with a landowner somewhere. We were working at the Steinbruch. Mm -hmm. uh, we got some, at the end of the week, we got the, uh, some coupons to buy little things, which was not much of a value. The food we got from uh, downstairs from the uh, from the bar, they, they their kitchen prepared the food, and I was that time as the dolmetcher, the uh, going down and taking the food, uh, uh, translating, going down taking the food, bringing up to the hall where you were sleeping, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, I didn't have much contact uh, with any uh, Germans there, but I, I have to mention that that was an old woman, it must have been the mother of the couple that belonged to the beer hall, belonged to them. And the mother was a very old woman, she slipped me in over some bread. And they realized it or what, I don't know, but uh, they took it away. I, I didn't meet her, possible. They made sure that she wouldn't be in the time when we come down for the, f for the soup or the other food, that she should be there. So I didn't see her. Once she did it, what I remember. And I like to emphasize any little touch of humanity that we, I felt in the time of the terrible Holocaust time. I like to emphasize it. So that's why I'm telling you. Um, and uh, I used to, uh, we were a group about 40 or 60 prisoners that we, yeah, maybe close to 100. I really don't remember. So I used to walk with a, a German uh, guard. Uh, behind and the group used to walk in front and it seems that he had some uh, uh, different leanings than the Nazi leanings, you know, beliefs. And he said to me, they are big shots, they are strong people with you, let them go on the Russian front. That's what he said to me. But it didn't take long, he, they, they transferred him. So it seems that uh, maybe they sent him to the Russian front, uh -huh. possible, but I, I didn't see him. But it's still uh, now uh, no war between Russia and Germany. That uh, no, that time was it already? It was forty. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Some. You are still at thirty nine. Right. No, it was forty. You uh, were a prisoner of war until forty. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. oh. Ah, for how long you were prisoner? Yeah, I have to uh, go back to it. Uh, no, uh, or, or he or said the Russian front, or he said the other front. I don't know. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're right. The Russian front started when I was released already from the uh, 1941. Yes. Uh, you, uh, thank you for correcting me. And I remember. Uh, um, I'll come back later on, but okay. I want to mention to correct that. Never mind. You mean the front, maybe, to fight? You tell, yeah, you go, okay, you, yeah. Okay. And uh, so uh, before, before uh, they transferred him, it came in an order that uh, we, as a Jewish group, we have to go back to the main camp from where they send us. So uh, he told me that, and I said to the other Polish group go back and he says no. I say what is it? Can you tell me what it is? I say I said to him, if it's for a Jewish group, I don't feel it's anything good. He says, I don't know myself. That's what he told you me. Speak German with you? I spoke German with mm -hmm. him. I told you I, I we had German in the in the school. We uh -huh. took up uh, German as a language. So uh, we came back to the main uh, camp and they were talking, the rumors were going around 
that uh, uh, the ones that belong to the uh, German Gebiet, what is Gebiet? Uh, territory. Territory. So uh, th uh, they're going to be free. And the ones that belong to the Russian territory, the, the Jews. We're talking about freeing Jews, nobody else. Mm -hmm. other, other nationalities were all kind of nationalities. They were talking about freeing the, the Jews, mm -hmm. and the ones that belonged to the, on the Russian part, uh, they're not talking about. And so some Did ignore, you give them to go? No. Some ignored the rumors. And, uh, uh, but I'm going to tell you something. I registered, every time was a registration there, in, in, the, in the, the POWs. This was in Alten Grobe? Alten Grobov. Alten Grobov? Yeah. This, Alten Gr the main camp? The main, the main camp, yes. yes. So when we came back, and all the time I registered that I was born in Lemberg, I figured that they have a pact with the Russians, that they will let the... Lemberg is in the Russian, Russian side. side. Mm -hmm. That they will let the Russians, the prisoners out first. And when I came back, all my registration up to that time when they sent us back to the, from the working, from the Steinbruch, uh, up to main, uh, send us back, yes. I was registered that, that I was born in Lemberg, not in Ripien. Yes. I felt that maybe they have a pact with Russia, maybe they let us go first. But when I came back to the camp and the rumor started uh, that they're going to send out the ones on the German Gebiet, they're going to release it. And you know, we have, how many senses does a person have? Five, six? <laughs> but we had an additional sense in the wartime, and that, that was intuition. You did a lot of things with the intuition. Mm -hmm. And something told me, change it. So the registration was a new now. No, we came back, a new registration, and I, at that time, I registered that I was born in Ripien, mm -hmm. you know. And I was very close with one friend of mine, that they took him to a different commando, and they said that all the commanders coming back to the main camp, so I was waiting for him to, to come back. Mm -hmm. We both registered that we were born in Lemberg, so I was waiting for him to come back. And when he came, arrived, and I said, Chaim, I changed that I was born in Ripien. Oh, he says, I can't do anything with you. I said, that's what I did. And I, he says, he's not going to change. Mm -hmm. So his sisters, the family, they, everybody was running in the wartime, and they got stuck in Vilna. And from Vilna was a short time that People could go even to Palestine that time, I think. They could, uh, uh, they, they, they had a chance of going from Vilna somewhere. So he got letters from the sisters that the sisters are in Vilna. And he says he's not going to change. So he, le he was left that he was born in Lemberg. Yes. And the truth was eventually that came out after a few days that the ones that born in the German Gebiet, like our town was right away incorporated, Ripien, our town there, yes. to the yes. Deutsches Reich. Yes. So the ones that they were born, they're going to be released. Because the Germans are there anywhere. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, uh, yes. but they didn't release the ones on the Russian side. Yes. And they, Rumors that was going around that they took the POWs, the Jewish POWs born on the Russian side, which my friend was fictitiously, they took to Lublin and they finished them up there. That was the rumors there going around. Now anyway, so the day came that they took us to the uh, plots, you know, to the place. gathering place. Mm -hmm. And we were loaded on uh, wagons, not uh, Holocaust-type mm -hmm. sealed wagons. 
and we came to Warsaw. In Warsaw, the Jewish committee, the Jewish Gemeinde, gave us a release from the POW. And we got a small car at that time, and you were released. Now, the Warsaw was the protectorate. It didn't belong to the Deutsche Reich. So, as a war prisoner coming back, I couldn't get a, a permit. I knew that I found out that my parents are in Makuf, which is not, it's not far, it's near Chekhanov. Uh, the Polish woman that was with us since a youngster, really, in the family, I wrote to, to the town of where I was born mm -hmm. to find out what happened. And she wrote me that she got a letter from the parents that they are in uh, Makov, Mazowiecki, they used to call. Mm -hmm. So I knew that the family is in Makov, Makov Mazowiecki. So a Jew was not allowed to go on a, any transportation. Not on, a, not on a train or a bus, and no permit I could get to go to the family as a POW. No way I could get a permit. So, like I said before, my intuition didn't work that time. But, but after a time being in Warsaw, I was in a room that I saw hanging a cane on, on the oven somewhere, on the European ovens, the big tile ovens. I still see it now. And I say, as a POW with the Polish long coat still having, I'm going to limp. Mm -hmm. And I falsified the permit. No Jew was allowed uh, on, on, the, on the station there anyway. Mm -hmm. And I went with this permit, supporting myself with the cane. I went over to get a ticket to Chekhanov. That was the a train didn't go to Makov. It went to Chekhanov, was a railroad station. And that man behind there, which I can say was a Polish man. He looked at it. He doesn't say anything. He took the permit, closed his office, and I watched him. He's talking with the, that, the stormtroopers with the, with the black uh, uniforms and, and the skulls. The yeah, the skulls, uh, emblem. Yes. He was talking to him, and I figured, who knows what's going to be. And he called me over. So when he called me over, he I was, was starting. Polish? Huh? The first was Polish? No, the one by the, what sold the He went the to ticket. the Germans? Yes. The one who took the, the ticket was Polish? Yeah. I, I was a Polish man yes. uh, behind there. And, uh, uh, and uh, he called me over, so I limped. And my German was pretty good. And I tell him that I came out from the hospital. They transferred me from the hospital to Warsaw. And I came now and I want to go to my family, which is in Makov. I want to go to Chekhanov. Uh, he asked me how long were you in the hospital? And I said a, f a few months or two months or something like it. I was, I was over a year in POW, so uh, I lied to him, but uh, uh, I figured it's going to work maybe. And he says to him, they has, says to him, oh man, uh, sell him a ticket. So I came back and he says, I, I knew that the train was leaving maybe in, in five minutes, was leaving to 
the train. And he says, you have to wait for the next one. And I figured as a Jew, wait in a, in a place like that, I was afraid. So I, I, I nearly choked me. I, I had tears in my eyes that time. It seems that the uh, Polish worker that worked on, 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 the, on the railroad there, he winked to me like this, you know, and I followed him. Mm -hmm. And he took me outside where the tracks are, and he said, go to that uh, uh, train, and that train goes to Chekhanov, mm -hmm. Chekhanova. And that's what I did, without a ticket. I went in there, mm -hmm. and that train went to a certain stop to, I think they call this the Protectoriat, the Warsaw section, the Protectoriat, they call it. Protectoriat. Okay. Mm. It went up to that point, and later on, you had to go, uh, it didn't go to Chaganov. Chaganov was already to the Deutsches Reich mm -hmm. belonging. Mm -hmm. So when I, it just happened that I fell into a, a mine wagon when I was there. I fell in with a group, but I realized later that they were, I'll call this smuggling, you know, food they brought in from outside to Warsaw, you know, outside of Warsaw. They brought in to Warsaw. Okay. This was their work. Okay. So when the, when the train uh, uh, stopped, they didn't go further. I didn't know what to do. So one woman, which I was sitting in the same compartment, I told her that I want to go to Chekhanov, Chekhanov. And I started walking with her. You said, she said, follow me. Uh, you know, we spoke in Polish for quite a long time. And she told me that she was an officer's wife, used to be in and the husband, I think, is uh, somewhere as so a war prisoner, or uh, I don't remember. I followed her, and we came to a river that somebody was waiting there with a little boat to take over. Everybody paid for it, but it seems that or somebody paid for me, or they let me go without it, and, and we climbed. Um, because he looks like one of the heroes who came from the battle. No, I, I wore that, <laughs> no, I wore that Polish steel coat, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing in Warsaw I had to change is the insignias, the button with the insignias. It was uh, the Polish insignia that, uh, that also, uh, that, uh, what do you call that, that, uh, that also, uh, what do you call it in English? The yeah. eagle. The eagle, right. Mm -hmm. I don't know Polish, but I Yeah, the eagle, the eagle you the know, that, right. Uh, the symbol. eagle was on the buttons, mm -hmm. and I had to change that to the civilian buttons. But the, the, the coat I was able to keep. So wearing that uniform, military uniform, mm -hmm. gave me, and walking with a cane also, it gave me a little sympathy. Anyway, we climbed up some uh, uh, mountain, and we came on the other side already, to the Deutsches Reich. Now we came to a small uh, railroad station. Mm -hmm. Now I went through without a ticket from there. The conductor didn't bother me. But there in that small railroad station, the train came and it was a door opening, maybe like this one. And the conductor took tickets from everybody. You had to have German money to buy tickets. You know? I didn't have any uh, German money to buy the ticket. Uh, this was in what uh, year? That's already, what? I don't know what, but it was 40? already on the, on the... 1940 or more? Uh, uh, more, uh, sure, late, uh, uh, late 41. You mean I after was the over war, a year. After the war with Russia start? No, After June before, 41? Before. Before June 41? Yeah, oh sure. I, mean, the first I tell you, yeah, I tell you, I'll come to it now. Uh -huh. I, I know one thing, when the war started, I was already in Makuf, and I was laying on the ground and reading. Okay, okay. 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 So, uh, so uh, going out from the 
I, I, I went through, I didn't have a ticket. The train. I, mm -hmm. I went through the conductor. I, I didn't, I didn't, didn't, I don't know why, you? don't ask me. I went through. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would stop me, pass over, I'm sure it was a German conductor. So I came on the train already without a ticket. And the conductor started punching the tickets. And they came to me and I started looking all over my packets. I say I had a ticket and, and uh, I don't know where it is. I, I don't know. I, I was so excited uh, uh, and, and he passed me. Mm -hmm. Now, and I knew that in Chekhanov, they're very strict going out. This is the last stop, I think, from the train, going out from there. Before you go into the uh, railroad station, the yeah. Germans check you, mm -hmm. and if they find anybody, uh, a Jew or somebody, they put him in prison. Mm -hmm. That was, I knew already from Warsaw, mm -hmm. that was the, the story. So I walk with the cane limping, and I come to the entrance of the railroad station, and I don't have any ticket or nothing, and, and, and uh, they kept me, pushed me on the side. And I figured, I'm going to get it. Mm -hmm. The conductor what passed me, and then, uh, and, you know, I didn't have the ticket, and, and he let me by. He came, and he says, oh, in German. Let him through. He came down with me all, all the way, and they let me out. And I walk on the uh, limping on the cane as much as is possible. And how to get the transportation from Chekhanov to Makov? I couldn't get a transportation, no bus or anything. They weren't allowed mm -hmm. for a Jew to ride any any transportation. So, this was already in the evening, and uh, a truck came by with pigs, mm -hmm. and I asked the, the driver what direction he's going. I said, I'm going, I need to go to Makov, and he says, get on. So, between the pigs, uh, I traveled to Makov. Uh, I had, I know where my parents were, and it's a uh, very moving thing. I came up, they were in a small room, living, that time was the beginning of, was not, there were no uh, talk about ghetto or anything. So I came up. Uh, you can imagine the, the reception. Uh, it was one and a half year or something that you yes, really didn't yeah, see. After, you. after yeah, they, mm -hmm. they knew that I was taken as a war prisoner. Mm -hmm. They knew. And what about other, uh, I mean, who, who were there in this room? Your parents? My, and my, f my uh, mother, father, and three little sisters. Mm -hmm. My younger sister was a uh, about five, six years old, and the next one was about ten years old, and the older one was about fourteen. Mm -hmm. And this, it didn't take long that they start, when I, you look back, you see the plan what they had. They start grouping, the gathering the Jewish people in a certain spot of Makov. Mm -hmm. So we moved once with all the possession of what we have. And from that place we had to move again. So every time you leave things, you're not going to carry it. It becomes nowhere to go. 
So the whole possession from the whole family became sold from all the movings. It was on a hand wagon. Mm -hmm. The whole possession. Yes. So we came, we lived in a, already in a place that it seems that was suited for the German, that that's going to be there, and we live there now. And they started liquidating towns around Makov, where the Jews were, like Pultusk. I think I'm not from that, uh, 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 you know, section. Area. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I know it was Pultusk, I know distinctly. Uh, uh, Ruzhan, I think Chekhanov, they sent to Malava. Uh, anyway, they start gathering the Jews from outside of Makov, bring them into Makov, and they didn't have the housing for them. So the solution for them was they took whole families on forced labor, send them out to landowners, to different different camps, working camps. Uh, I was separated from the family. I, I was in a different working camp. And my father and mother and three sisters were sent in a different... I didn't know where they were sent. But finally, I had to locate them, <coughs> and I wanted to know where they are. And I located them, and on Sunday we had off. And I went to see to find them, and I found them. I found my old parents in a, in a, a firehouse, laying on little straw on the cement, on, on the cement floor with a little straw on it, with a little daughters, my sisters there. Uh, it was heartbreaking. I had to go back to my place and finally, like I said before, that my father dealt with the landowners and the landowners in Poland is like a, a aristocracy by themselves. They all know each other. And somebody registered there the name of my father Mordechai Nansel, and he looked at him and he says, aren't you from there and there? He says, yes, and he started mentioning all the, mentioning all the landowners uh, from uh, what he knows, and, they, and, and the one that registered him, he knew. The, and uh, he was part of the landowners there. And my father asked him one favor, get us out of here, get us back to Makov. And, and that's what happened. He, they got back to Makov and I was... So you were on the point uh, where your parents wanted to move back to Makov, yes? No, they, they, yeah, oh yeah, from that uh, camp there, that they were there. What was the name of the place? No, there? it's no, no special name. It was a landowner's place. Mm -hmm. Father used to go to work, mother and the children didn't. But the, 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 the way they were sleeping, a little straw on the cement floor, it broke my heart. And uh, finally, through the, uh, somebody recognized my father. He was influential in sending back the family to Makov. Mm -hmm. Usually, later on, we realized that some people had to pay the Germans, the, the German Bürgermeister to come back to Makov, all kind of ways. They paid in dollars or, or, or money just to get back to Makov. And here, my family came back and they didn't know how to come back. They didn't pay anything. 
they, they couldn't believe that somebody uh, influenced uh, uh, the, the decision to send them back. And it's one from the landowners that knew that father was doing business before the war with the landowners and his uh, around Ripchen. Mm -hmm. So like I said, the landowners is like an aristocracy by itself. And that person did a favor. I think it was a woman that did a favor and the family got back to Makov. So when we came back to Makov, so yeah, they, they send out the people from there and the people that came in took our places from before. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have any place where to go, where to look. It was no, it was a, a burned down house. The top was, the, the, the roof and everything was burned down. When you walked in inside, it looked all right. So my father got a permit to move into that house. He had to, they, they didn't let it before anybody move in. So <clears throat> they moved into that house and they, I started working on construction. They, I had to go every day to work on construction. They were building, the German, German firm was building something there. And we, we were already settled on that thing. So the first rain it came, it didn't rain in without the roof open. Mm -hmm. We said to ourselves, how beautiful. The angels uh, is covering up the, the roof or something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't rain in. The second day it was raining. Now, from all the fire and uh, what was burned down, that thing absorbed uh, uh, the rain. So it didn't go through. And the second day, I came home from work, from the construction work. I didn't have a place where to stand and change my clothes. It was raining in. So that's, that's the type of a, a chorus. So the only reason I went out with my father in the backyard of that house, and it was a little shack there. And uh, I said to my father, we have to build something from this, what stays here, we have to cover up something with the house, maybe we'll be successful. So we took apart that shack, we took apart and we used that uh, uh, material for putting a, any way it's possible, a little cover on the, above the uh, uh, rooms. We were successful. I know that I did a little bit from construction. <clears throat> I used my knowledge to it and we were successful, I can say. And in this, uh, in the rooms, we stood up to liquidation. So this was still not a ghetto, closed up ghetto. Uh, it was still open. And after, I remember, which usually this was the uh, system of the Germans, that everything they did on holidays. So on, on Rosh Hashanah, they, they came in. We were in private homes gathering and praying. The synagogue in Makov was burned down like any other places. There was no synagogue. So we pray, prayed in some private homes and the uh, news came that they putting up a fence around the community. And that's Ayim Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, that time, this on is high 41, holidays. Eh? Yes. This is yes. The yeah. autumn 41? Yes. Uh, they uh, started putting up a fence around the Mm -hmm. uh, community, and it became a fenced-in ghetto. And they had two openings in that fence. One is in the front, 
to take out the people for forced labor or any type of labor going out. And was Makov was a river going through, or is still going through, possible. And the the opening to the river, the the opening to the river was once a day in the morning for people to bring in water for all kind of purposes. And a lot of people went out there and they committed suicide. They never came back. They drowned. How did they? They committed, they went in and drowned. Uh huh, down. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, they used that. Uh, uh, so with all the people sent in, with all the congestion, what happened, and with all the unsanitary things, what was going on, people got, got it in such a close quarters, and with the food terrible, uh, and they start uh, smuggling in. Smuggling is a word to use for smugglers. They start to bring in food. They used to check the workers coming in. And they used to uh, close the end of the pants with a string and put potatoes in there. You know, sometimes they succeeded to bring in from work, bring into the ghetto, but they searched every time that the group came in back to the ghetto, they searched, and some, some got beaten terribly. <coughs> and a lot of times at night, the young people jumped over the fence to go outside and, and get some food if it's possible. Some got shot too. With all the conditions, an epidemic of typhus broke out. And uh, uh, people were dying. And it just happened to be that I contacted too. Typhus. And the Germans realized that if they're not going to control it, it could be come outside of the ghetto to the Arab population. So they allowed the Jewish community to bring down a doctor from Warsaw. And the doctor came down, and first thing the order was to separate, to quarantine the sick. But where will you quarantine when there's no place for anything? So from the homes that the Jews were chased out before the ghetto and brought into the ghetto, but outside of the fence, the empty homes were used for quarantining the sick. Now, uh, I, I never like to involve my personal thing, I, 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 you know, not here to tell about my personal, in general about history I like to talk. But happened that they gave up on me. They thought that I'm a goner already. I got the wrong medications. I still remember that the convulsion that I, ha I had that time after the medication, medication that they sat on my bed and the bed was uh, shaking. shaking. And I remember that there uh, was flowers on the wall and I saw the flowers, I, I saw that uh, like Tatars holding knives in, in their mouth. Mm -hmm. That's the picture what I got that time. Anyway, I pulled through. And I came back to the ghetto. And I came to myself. And not a long time after, I missed the the time of the Russians started the war. But this is a small incident when I, yeah, I missed something too. When I came as a PLW, can I go back? Yes, of course. Can I, when I came as a PLW uh, to Makov, I had to register to and the police, at the police station, mm -hmm. for rations to get, you know, a, a newcomer, you have to register. So I went there with that the long coat, Polish coat, Polish army coat, and uh, I registered. After I was finished, the German gave me a smack in my face and it hit me so hard that I fell to the ground. And I asked myself, why? 
I'm not going to ask him. It's no, it's no use. I didn't do anything. But I asked myself, why did he hit me? I came to register. So when I look back, I see that this was a system of take away the dignity of a person. You are nothing. I didn't do anything, and he hit me so hard. So it was an approach to take away the little dignity what a person has. Now this was before the ghetto started. I have to go back a little bit <coughs> to give you a little background of it. The order came to wear yellow. We wore, on the Deutsche Reich, we wore a, a patch, a yellow patch we, we wore. And in other places, they had a Jewish star saying Jude. Yes. We were a, we wore a patch. When the order came that you're not allowed to walk on the sidewalk, you have to walk in the, uh, off the sidewalk in the, in the middle of the street, and you have to wear a yellow patch. Patch. I took my best suit, my one suit what I had that time, and I saw that yellow patch on. And I, I had something in me that during the, with all the worst thing, I had something that I had like a little dignity left. I was walking uh, with the yellow patch and I said, they should worry about it. It's not my fault. It's their fault that they put it on me. That was my feeling for it. And I didn't mind. You had to tip your head. If you had a head for every German military, you had to tip your head. And if you didn't, he can take out his gun and shoot you too, which a lot of times happen. And this, this is all incidents, little incidents, which is really brings out the approach, the system, what they had. Uh, they took a, uh, in the winter time, they took a man in the street and they poured over a, a pail of cold water and it became like ice, you know, for no reason. Mm -hmm. So what other reason could they have except make a nothing of the person? They took a prominent wife of a prominent Jewish man, which has just happened, my daughter of that man, I just visited here in Israel and uh, near, near Bat Yam. Yesterday I was there. Mm -hmm. Her mother, they took her mother and they stripped her for the reason was that she had, the hair were too long. Now this is a, a wife of a prominent man in the community and they gave her some lashes in the middle of the square in the town. It's no for no other reason to break you down. And that's the approach, what they had. And uh, 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 frankly speaking, now I'm already I'm, I'm in that uh, uh, conversation, that team, they did break down the, the dignity of the people, the way they transferred them and everything. And they threw you into the camp and they gave you a number. You're not anymore a person. You're a number. If I I would say that my, I can't say the number in any other language except in German. It's their baby. It's 283, That's my number. And I wouldn't dare even the, the English language to say it in English. It belongs to that part to the Holocaust part, to their part. So they gave even, that was the system of it. When you look back, they, they freed me as a, as a POW, a Jewish... The, POW. Yeah, the gathering of the Jews was already that time, seems as a system. They didn't release anybody else except the Jews, prisoners. Yes. So at that time, I really started it. Anyway, uh, Going back uh, with the ghetto, uh, the typhus epidemic, he arrested it as much. And people got shot one day, you always heard this one got shot. And for only one reason that they caught him, 
jumping the fence and bringing in some food. Now, one day they started digging some holes in the ground <coughs> in a little square. The square was really the place where the synagogue was burned down. That was a little gathering place. And this is a mark of Mazovetsky, the ghetto there. Uh, nobody know what the digging is for it. After a few days, we heard that they arrested about 11 people. One for a crime that he jumped the fence and he brought in food. One, well, it's no difference, the reason. You don't have to look for reasons. When you look back on it, they took whole towns and they, and they, they finished up. So we're not going to look for a reason. They found a reason and they took 11 people prepared for hanging. And between the 11 people was the doctor. The doctor that treated me. And possibly he was influential that I would pull through. So they, they kept him arrested in the room. And they announced, that, yeah, they put up a, a, sc a scuffle, a, a hanging, a clear. Yeah. A scuff, scuffle, scuffle in English. They put up the, the hand for hanging. The, uh, the bars, you know, a scuffle, I think, right? isn't it? A scuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, uh, uh, it, uh, they're prepared for the hanging. Yeah. And they announced, the German announced, that everybody has to be out and watch. If they're going to find somebody in the, in the, in the house, it's going to be shut. So, on the day of hanging, my parent, parents went with the, my little sisters out there, and I said, I'm not going to myself. And I hid in an outside house, you know where it is, outside, a bed shimush outside. You mean the toilet were outside? Outside, the yes. WC? Yeah, that's uh, European, a lot of places there. Mm -hmm. And behind, not in the front, but behind there, I went in where they all, you know, I hid there and I figured they're not going to look there. Being there and I felt that I'm safe, I said, what am I doing here? My father, mother and sisters are there. Who am I? So I went out and I joined them. Now they all was putting in a line. In the front facing us was Germans with machine guns facing us. And they announced that anybody showing any tears will be shot. That's unhuman, mm -hmm. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And they brought in little hand wagons. They put the people as puzzles. Is it going to be hanged? They put them on the little wagons. And they put the ropes around them. And they put the little wagons away. And they start twirling. The body start twirling. I felt for everybody that I would like to help, but I went to run over to the doctor and take him down. And they, when they gave the order to disperse, uh, a stampede happened. We we, we ran and and uh, we fell. And they jumped over each other. A real stampede. When I came to the house, I threw myself on, on, on the bed and I started crying that time. 
The German actually made it, or it was uh, the German other, made it. I mean, Polish or Ukrainian. No, 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 the German. The German made it. And one thing I can say that outside of the ghetto was homes of the Polish people. And in some windows, I, I saw people s sitting and watching. Uh -huh. So anyway, uh, uh, and this was a very bitter pill. Uh, what does it do to people's mind to, to, to watch something like it, not to able to cry or not to show any emotions? What did they, they try to make uh, uh, nothing of everybody? In a lot of t places they succeeded too. <coughs> and uh, we didn't hear much of news from the outside. All kind of rumors they were talking that people being sent to working camps. Uh, young people have a better chance than all the ones. That's all the rumors what was going on. But nobody knew about, nobody would m imagine of anything what they prepared. And especially the older people remember that the Germans were there in Poland in 1916 or 14, uh, that they did business and, 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 and they, they, it was a different time. They, who, can, uh, who can expect that the same German people would prepare something like it? It was unbelievable. It was hard to believe. Uh, so the day came, they announced that they're going <coughs> to, the daily life in the ghetto, if you want me to describe, was zero, nothing. The, uh, what did you eat? Nothing much what, what we were able to. Uh, uh, you what still we have money? Huh? You still have money? Uh, my family was lucky that uh, um, somebody, a woman was traveling, first thing they sold all the possession, all the jewelry, what they had, what they were able to. Uh, and we were lucky, one thing, I only postponed it for a little time, that the Polish woman, that she came as a young girl with us, and, and, and she was a grown-up woman, really. Uh, even in the war time, she didn't want to leave the parents. She was running away from Ripien together with my parents, and my mother chased her back. You don't belong here. Now, this woman had some jewelry from the family when they were chased out from Ripien. So she sent in, before the ghetto started, she sent in a, a, a bag of sugar miraculously arrived from Ripien to Makov and in the sugar was a, a, a snuff box, a tabakerka, a ebony black tabakerka, a mm -hmm. snuff box. And there was my mother's uh, watch with a long chain and she sent, sent this with, in the sugar. So that gave us a little time of prolonging, you know. So you buy anything that is possible, and anything that's throwing in through the fence. It was smuggling going on, you, you, you know, the ones that uh, finally came a time that we didn't have it. So the woman that was traveling with my family, she started off from Ripien, really. She got attached to the family. She had some money, so she shared with the family. Mm. And uh, uh, it was uh, no activities, nothing. Uh, nothing, uh, it's just a, a prison, a, open, uh, a fenced in open prison. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And the time they announced that they're going to liquidate the ghetto and that we're going to Malava. Now, before the liquidation... How long you were in Makov in this ghetto? You know, when it comes to date, I... I when did you 
when uh, when it was liquidated, I really don't. I know that in, in Malabo, I was about three months maybe, right? Mm -hmm. And so in December 1942, I came to Auschwitz. So it was in September. Something like it has. When you yeah. went to from Makov to Malabo. Malabo, right. September 42. For so you were uh, yeah. here or something in Makov? Yes, yes. Did you ever work there in this ghetto? Construction. They took me out of uh, construction work. Uh -huh. And because you mentioned in the beginning, in the conversation before yeah. the interview about you were a professional uh, watchmaking. Watch, watch no, no, I didn't. They took the construction work. Uh -huh. And in construction work, I'm going to tell you a, a simple episode what happened. The German uh, architect, the German engineer architect, what do you call, he made a contest. Um, the bricks was, I'm, I'm talking about me personal, which I don't like it. The bricks was separated, separated every few meters was separated, let's say 200 bricks. Yeah. And you were cutting it on a wooden horse, they used to call that. It's a wooden, uh, uh, yeah, nice. which rests on, on your shoulders, and it's a plain uh, uh, board in the back that holds the, the uh, uh, bricks. You take the bargain on it or something. The bricks uh, holds in, in the back, you know. Mm -hmm. And then um, he took out a stopwatch, and uh, he timed it. Who was going to finish the 200 bricks? Yeah. You had to climb on a ladder, like a cat. Yeah. It's not a, that you go up on, a, on, a, on a something moving. You had to climb on a ladder, not holding this on, you know. And he says, who's going to be first? So uh, uh, we had that time uh, Polish workers too, a lot of them, civilian workers. And to all surprises, I took the first place in it. Uh -huh. So he went into the uh, to the office, <coughs> and he came out, and he shakes his hand. Unbelievable, he says, "You're a watchmaker. You're a Ulmacher." Mm. So, in a way, uh, I had a little bit of favors from him later on. And how did he know that you? Uh, he had it. He had it in the listing. Uh -huh. He went in to see who, who David Nansel is. Uh -huh. So he sees that I'm a professional as a watchmaker, and I took the first place. Uh -huh. So after that, he really had a little bit of a civilian German, you know. I fixed his clock in his home, you know. So it's a little soft nap for me that time, but it, that's construction work. That's what I did. But it's no way of, of reading anything, no way of listening anything in the ghetto, nothing. The construction was actually outside the ghetto? Hmm? The work was outside the ghetto. Yeah, that German farm that they were building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when they, uh, before the uh, closing of the ghetto, before the evacuation, you know, all the prayer books and all the prayer shawls and all the, uh, what do you call that in English, I can never pronounce, the Twillin. Uh, uh, Twillin, okay. The tw mm. Okay, the Twillin. Well, the Jewish thing is a uh, religious thing. Religious thing. Uh, uh, you, you don't discard that. You, you really, you don't burn, maybe burn it, but you bury it mm. according to religious law. You bury it like, like you bury a, a person. So before the liquidation of the ghetto, we knew that uh, everything is going to be closed up in a backyard of somebody's uh, house oh, there. Uh -huh. They made a ditch yes. and they brought in all the things and it was covered yeah. there. And the day of the um, evacuation came, they got us together on a open place and the horse and wagons were lined up mm -hmm. uh, they driven by the poles you know and the, they were a master of creating commotion you know starting hitting and all kind of things uh, 
distract the people. And they announced that all any jewelry has to be given up. And a woman asked him the wedding bands they took off. The wedding bands they took off. Everybody had to take off the wedding bands and leave it. Now they searched one young woman and she had on her brazier a ring. He shot her on the spot. So after that, everybody starts throwing anything he has. And after the thing, the thing was over, they start beating, chasing, loading on the, on the wagons. My family, my mother, I, and the, the horses start going. I had my mother, half of the, her body outside the wagon and holding it up and running after, after the horse and wagon, they started moving right away. They didn't care if you were on it or not, you know, they just, you had, you had to be, make it quick. And uh, when I used to talk about it, I used to break down this every time, but it seems that what time does to you. I was holding my, half of the body of my mother off the wagon, I was holding it and trying to push her on, on the wagon, and finally I succeeded. So we were traveling with horse and wagon, we were traveling to Mulava. And I think this was about, I don't know, in kilometers. Mm, I know from Ripien it was 67 kilometers. From Makov, I really don't know. Uh, but we traveled for quite a time, practically the whole day. And we came there and we got situated somewhere. And there we didn't go to work. This Malava had a railroad station. So this was the, uh, the place of debarkation that they send out the people. And uh, there I worked as a watchmaker at somebody's place. Was a watchmaker there, in Malava. Malava, and uh, I worked as a watchmaker, and, and for, somebody else's. For what clients? I don't know. I didn't ask questions. You know, uh, some other our watchman. own people had watches, right? Mm -hmm. And from the outside, possible too. He was knowing uh, another man, and uh, Polish I, man. Hmm? Polish? No, a Jew. This was in the ghetto. Ah, really. for a Jew. Yeah. He's another Jew. Yes. Uh -huh. the this was the ghetto. This, this was already in Malawi ghetto established that time. The German didn't take the, these things for me from the Jews. Not that time. Uh -huh. Not that time. Passover they needed them. Later. And I worked. I worked there. And um, finally, they start preparing for for uh, transporting the people out of Malawi. So every time they had some different rumors going on. They assembled us on an open place, and uh, just a moment. When you worked there, you got a salary, or you got yes, food, sure. or what? You, I got some. How it was organized? I I got paid something, and whatever food was available there, uh, it helped. You mean you could buy food in stores? Yes, uh, 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 the same thing. Uh, uh, they some food was brought in. Uh, uh, some food was brought in all kind of ways, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the organ organization of Malavo Ghetto, I really don't know. I was a short time there, and it was working, not outside. And they start bringing in people from all, all small towns there. Um, but from time to time, all kind of rumors came, and were working or not working, they announced that everybody has to be in a certain place and they're going to test for uh, uh, capability um, to uh, transfer you to working camps. So what they did, they got us together in an open place and they took a stick, a long stick, and they were holding it, one person on this side and the other side, and if you jumped over, you were fit for the working camp. Mm -hmm. And the ones that did not, they weren't fit. Oh, 
to mix you up really, to to think that you're going, and they said that you to getting mislead it, huh? yeah, to mistake you Mis yeah it. The, to mislead you mislead okay. yeah uh, yes. and uh, and they said that all the professional men like uh, uh, mechanics and other ones like watchmakers they're going to have a separate building which they're going to work for the German army. Baloney, it was not true. The day of, of uh, closing up the ghetto, uh, I sold in my tools, the watchmaker tools, yeah. and my coat, and I figured maybe I'll have a chance I don't know where I'm going. They loaded us on the famous locked up wagons. You mean Catholic cars? The cars, the Katu cars. You were with someone from your family? Yes, the father, mother, and the sisters. And uh, when I look back that time, when I start writing the story about it, it took me years to come to it. I gave it to my two daughters, what I written. But it, it, when I wrote that they locked up the cattle cars and, and, and they sealed them and, and they assess, I couldn't continue anymore. I got very angry how they got us in there. You mean you could escape? Something? No. But I got, I'm just talking now, when I look back on it, I couldn't write anymore after, after that episode. And you feel paralyzed. I just couldn't write if, I don't care what. I couldn't, I couldn't get myself, I was, was, I got so angry that I felt that something's going to happen to me. That they got us in, in such a situation, you know, we know what the cattle cars were, that people died, people, in their own uh, human uh, body uh, discharge, they 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 live there for a day and a half to two days with nothing, no water, no food, and they just died in the wagons. And I remember stopping on one station. This must have been systematically arranged. We died for water. And through that little opening, we screened for water. A uh, man was giving the horse a pail of water on the station. They stopped at some station. For what purpose was this done? To kill us, to, 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 to murder us, just to, to see it. We, we were without anything. And here the horse is getting water. You need a little water. We were screaming, yelling. It didn't help. What is the matter? And uh, we arrived to Auschwitz. Oh, you came at How night. How long were the, the way? The was way, nice about a, a day and a half, possible, or two days, maybe. I, uh, it was just terrible. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Drink water. Uh, we came to Auschwitz. It was in the evening. The floodlights, they opened up the, the, the wagons. They opened up. And uh, we saw some men dressed in striped suits, nobody knew what it is. And they started separating the men and the women, children. And the children want to stay together with the parents. Sisters and brothers wanted to stay together. They're hearing the screaming. The kids get beaten. They want to run over to the parents. Maybe the father was a younger man, they kept him on this side. And the people that worked there, when you look back, they, 
they help the kids to go on the other side and leave the mother like that she has a chance to live. They knew the selection. But goes on. But the kids were running back and forth, got hit from the from the Germans with the screaming. There's also and, other prisoners mm -hmm. there that you so speak with in this They moment. didn't talk. They didn't talk. They didn't talk. The Germans, up, they, when they open up the, the doors, they start hitting, they start creating, uh, you know, commotions and other things. Rose, rose, rose. And uh, you don't know what, when, and, uh, and finally, near the floodlights uh, were the German officers with their uh, high boots, uh, clean uniforms. And uh, they were saying right and left. We didn't know what it means. He looks at you and you go to the right, and he looks at somebody else, you go to the left. And later on, we realized that the one that walked to the camp and the one that rode on the trucks, they went to the crematoriums. Now, now starts the bitter pill of all things, that I witnessed it, the whole thing. You realize that uh, in December 42, it was uh, the first month yes, of, uh, that's, no. they are using the gas uh, chamber? No, no, you know, they used, I'll tell you, the not, not the real crematoriums, they didn't use that time. Yes. No, I'm going to come to it. I, mean, I the wound first up. Transports. I mean, it's no, not, uh, not so long. Uh, uh, like, uh, it was later. not in '42. It was in a different location, but they guessed it. I'm going to come to it. I'm going to yes. describe it. What happened to you in this moment? No. Okay. So I wound up. They sent me to Buna. Buna. Uh, Buna that, huh? Buna Monovic. No, Buna was the uh, place that the far IG Farben had to be. At that time we didn't know, but I was a short time in Buna. An epidemic broke out between the people that came with that transport where I came. That was the transport from Malava, you know, that came as a certain epidemic broke out. Yeah. And they sent us back from Buna to. Birkenau, Auschwitz Birkenau, Zizinki, I think in Polish that if they call that. And when we came there, they uh, directed us to uh, some barracks. Now I came into a barrack. Uh, it was the evening. Uh, we went to sleep. In the morning, we didn't go out from the barracks, the new people. I see other ones go out. I didn't know what kind of work. And they asked the people that I, I knew what I met them in the, in the, in the, before they went out from Malava. What are you doing? What goes on here? They didn't answer me. They say, you're going to be here, you'll know. Now, this was the Sunder Commando. Mm -hmm. <laughs> About three days later, they took us out, the new people, with the commando. We came at a place, it was two barracks, long barracks, separated between each other, maybe 20 meters, I was saying meters instead of feet, okay? And about 100 meters, no, or a little less, was an innocent looking farmer's house with a straw covered roof. You would think that the uh, farmer lives there. Who knows? Is it Brzezinka, this place? That, that, Birkenau? I don't know. Birkenau is Brzezinka, I think so. Mm. Anyway. This was after you were in Buna? 
Yes. I tell that they send us back a kind of the sickness yes. that broke out. Yeah. They send us back to Birkenau. Yes. Okay. In Birkenau, they, they divided the group to different blocks. Yes, I understand. And I landed in and that then you, block. You have your number already then? Yeah, yeah. sure. I had, I had the number. When the number, when you come in, they took away everything. They took away. When I what came in, I, I spoke before about it. I gave the number. Yes, uh, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna say. Auschwitz, I mean. Yes, from Auschwitz, yes. yes. Yeah, when I when I came in, I forgot to, to say to tell you. When I came in, they took away anything that your possession had, all the clothing, and everything, and I thought, and I have my tools, so then maybe I, I'm going to be as a, working as a watchmaker. They didn't care if you are a doctor or you are a professor or you are a watchmaker. You are a Jew. Mm -hmm. They took away everything. They stripped you completely. And this is the time when you come into Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad you reminded me. And that's the time they took away everything and then put the number that's, uh, like I said before, is 82321. That was the number of mine they gave me. And the guy that must have had a, a nice handwriting my number was uh, is uh, was very small. Uh, some uh, some uh, uh, some uh, of my friends that uh, they made a mistake on the number, and they crossed it over and they put the number on the top of that, so the whole arm was uh, was uh, tattooed really, but mine came out. All right, and like I said later on after the war, that I work work with the Bricha. Bricha, I would say the Bricha. The company was the uh, Palestine company was five forty four. Yes. Yes, and uh, I mentioned I'm going to mention now. We talk about the number. Now after the war, I I I felt that I'm going to work against the forces that stood aside and let everything happen. I don't care what. I had a knowledge of, of jewelry and watches and everything and I didn't go to any any business or, or any market or anything. I worked with the from the 544 in Naples, in Napoli. They were stationed and I worked with them for quite a long time. They worked, can I say it now, or talking or later? You start uh, just connection with the number. Because yeah, with the number. Go, yeah, the number. The, but the type of work I'm going to go in later. But the number at the end, they gave me a proposition to take somebody that's supposed to go back. He finished the service in the English army that time. The Jewish brigade was the English army. Yes. That he was carrying on with the bricha. Yes. This is Arya Hakim. Yes. Uh, uh, and that I. And they they asked me if I want to take his place, you got his papers. to somebody else's place. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. And as soon as I said, okay, I had a, a number. He, he was born in, in Palestine. And to take his place, they paid for it by a surgeon. And they took out the number, and I had the number for years in a little bottle, little flash of my part. I had it in a bottle, in alcohol. For mm. years I had it. And the alcohol ate up the number. I wanted to keep the number. They certain they wouldn't believe that I was in the camp, maybe for, for authorities or somebody, you know. Yes. But accidentally, in my marriage, which I... Well, I, I'm divorced about 13 years. Accidentally, I think, was thrown out, mm -hmm. you know. But that's the story of the number. And the work, I'm going to go in later with it, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, this, the number was uh, uh, 82, 3, 21. Mm -hmm. This was the number what I got. And uh, they took away everything, and they gave us the, the Dutch shoes. Wooden, wooden the shoes. wooden shoes, mm -hmm. and this was a murderous, 
a murderous thing for anybody with no food of anything there any little scrape on your body developed to a big thing I, like from the shoes the, the foot got rubbed off and started bleeding and this started like a like a, it's a it's a downhill for everybody was it so the first thing I realized before I went into the other commando it took a little time I need a pair of shoes so it was like a black market with the with the clothing and everything that they took away from the people like so I promised I would give a half of my bread every day for sh for a pair of shoes and that's how I got a pair of shoes I realized what was going on to whom you give somebody they was I t and like I say from the things that people brought in it created was created like a black market you can you can get a pair of shoes for a certain uh, you can get six uh, uh, potatoes for a cigarette. You mean to people who work in Canada commando? Yeah, no, things? anybody that has a little pool got there, or ones that were before, they had certain ways of acquiring certain things. How, where, and what, I, I really don't know. Anyway, so, uh, so coming back to the, uh, when I, the first day I got out with the Sunday commando, I came to that place in that little uh, house, innocent looking house with the straw covered roof. That was the guest, uh, guest, or the guest chamber. They the used guest. The guest. Uh, yes. They used. Uh, the rooms of the house were divided and the sealed, one room was sealed and the little trap door was on the outside that the German put in the cyclone uh, gas in it. Now, I want to go back a little bit. When they took the transport people on, on, the, on, the, on the trucks, is right at the end of the trucks was the Red Cross. Ambulance, you mean? Ambulance. So people thought, that possible if anybody needs it but the Red Cross carried the cycle, cycling B. gas yeah B cycling gas mm -hmm. now when I came there and I looked what was going on that about a hundred meters to be in dressed from the barracks to be in dressed and be chased in later on by dogs in the SS chased into that little house and be guests there. I know my parents went through the same thing with my sisters. They went through the same thing. And I couldn't take it that time. So it was another woman that has to be carried into the guest chambers. I took her on my hands, I carried her in, and I stood there between everybody. And before they sealed the chamber, they count the prisoners. Count? They count the prisoners before they sealed. Because it will be full. Yes. And I stood there. And I want to say, this I wanted to say right in the beginning, that anything what I'm telling now is true. I, I swear what is holy by me, what is holy by me is my parents, my family that were guests in Bern. So if I'm telling you now, that's what I say. I I, I just want to talk. About, don't want to talk about my personal uh, me 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 I I I. 
But this what happened to me. I stood there. I didn't want to go. I want to finish. You want to die? I wanted to die. So they pulled me out, took me out. And after that, I worked for quite a long time at clothing only. Who pulled you? Your friends? Jews? No, the couple. The, the couple. I didn't go to to the, uh, bringing the people to the chamber, to the guest chamber. Now, when after they, they were dead, from the other side of the house, a door was opened from the guest chambers, and a, a little trolley, like a little open wagons, the bodies were put on to the ditch, it was a ditch and wood prepared for every burning. The wood was on the bottom. Was it like a canals or a ditch? A, a ditch, you know, a big uh, open uh, field. Oh, yeah, yeah but in, in the ditch, ground. In the ground, yes. yes. And there was wood on the bottom of it, and the bodies was piled up on that after they were gassed. And they put a certain liquid on it to be to start the burn and that was the in the beginning of the used to do on the side of the big ditch opening or what do you call it was a, a place for the fat of the human fat to run on the side and we know that they use it for soap from the human, we know up to now everybody knows about it. And this was going on until they built the crematoriums. That's how they guessed, and how that's how they got the people and dressed in the barracks, chased them naked to the little house, that, that was the guest chamber at that time, and getting rid of the bodies in the burning ditch. This is the beginning of 43 already? Because you came in December yes. 42 to Auschwitz. Yeah. This was already a few months uh, in 43. Now, okay. we went, uh, it's another hour, right? Okay. All right. Okay, so you were uh, in the middle of uh, describing how the process of uh, eliminating the uh, yeah, eliminating the people. Yeah. Uh, um, they had a, it seems that they had a, a bureaucratic approach, sitting in, the, in their bureaus and planning of, of finishing up people. And that's how they started uh, the first, and later on, when they built the large crematoriums, it was crematorium number one, number two, which I am familiar with, and later on, three and four were small ones. Now. I wound up in crematorium two. It's the same building as crematorium one, but separated um, about a, with a road separated. On this side was crematorium one, and on this side was crematorium two, facing opposite each other directly. Um, now, I really don't know how to start. They had a, I'll describe the crematoriums. Okay. They had a large hall to undress going down. That was like a basement. Let's say in English, but going down was a large, a large hall for a few hundred people. And there was, uh, on the walls, it was hangers. 
and the, on the middle of the room was the, the beams, the posts, which are square, which around the posts was hangers and benches made. And I'm just going to uh, describe the crematorium first and later on when a transport comes in. What happened? Yeah. Yes. After this undressing room, um, doors opened up and you went in to the chamber, which does the chamber, the guest chamber was with um, uh, phony uh, head showers on the wall. When a person not knowing comes in, uh, he thinks it's going to be a shower. And a big heavy door with a little window opening. When the, when they close it, it was hermetically sealed. In the middle of the door was a, a window, like in a in a boat, you know, smaller, but it was a sealed window. And. Before the guessing of the people, the air was pulled out, which the machinery for the air pulling out was on the top of the crematorium level. And this was uh, done by a, um, a German uh, uh, engineer, mechanic, who knows what they called them. He was, he was also a political prisoner, that same German. But he took care of the own machinery and everything. And on the side of the uh, guest chamber was a little window high. And from, the, uh, from through that window they threw in the gas. You mean the Cyclone B? Yes. yes. And now let me start. Let's go like this. Uh, first, your task. You said you were when you an old woman. You were that. This is from the other. This is something describing the new. In the beginning. This is the new no, I want crematorium. To know what did you do? What was your job? So from the beginning, you were you you told us about uh, that you were with a woman, and then you changed to work in a clothes. Yes, I worked in the clothing. Uh, clothing. Uh, yes. Uh, in Birkenau. And uh, in, in Birkenau, yeah, right. Oh. And uh, later on, uh, they got me to do the same thing like anybody else. What? But after that, doing with the bodies and everything, uh, uh, the you dead bodies. Burning bodies. But. Uh, you know, in the in the first uh, way they eliminate the people that I described it right in the ditch. Yes. But later on, when they built the modern type, uh, I don't know what what big company built that thing with the ovens and and all kind of things with special rooms. Uh, this was built by a special engineering company and and. Uh, they had all kind of ways, I'm sure, with your interviewing, you know that they took the people and, 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 uh, and trucks, sealed trucks, and, the, and they guessed them. They, they in Chelmno, not in Auschwitz. In Chelmno. Yeah, um, I mean, they had all kind of ways. Know, but we are talking about... No, I know, but, but uh, it's, it's a way of, of eliminating people. Yes. Uh, uh, so it, the ones what I described before was in the old... Uh, way of they were doing, mm -hmm. and this one I'm describing now is the new crematoriums what they built. Was this was in another place. Another place completely. Mm -hmm. So you were moved also. Yes, mm -hmm. no, not uh, really moved, but uh, uh, the the barracks in the, in the camp was the same. That uh, we were were watched every time. Uh, the, uh, from uh, let's say like other groups came back from work somewhere, uh, they could go around the camp and, and uh, see somebody or talk somebody, who knows what. We were not allowed to leave the barracks. 
to mingle with the other prisoners. Mm -hmm. Who were other, uh, what other uh, colleagues or members? Was a, you? Was a Birkenau, was a big no, camp. In this uh, group, as you say, we, is under That group. our group, it was a few hundred people. From where? All over, from where? It's, uh, I Poland? Don't know. From Poland, yeah, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, some Greeks, uh, uh, from uh, a lot of nationalities. They, uh, they eliminate from our group too that uh, um, they took away, uh, uh, I started to describe the, the, uh, the crematoriums, the new crematoriums, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to give you the background of it from the old one with that straw uh, covered things with the new modern things what they built up. Um, when the uh, guest chamber, when they looked in, the German looked in, and after a certain time that they threw in the gas, they were waiting for the gas to be pulled out from the machinery. And that's time they opened this, the, the door, and the bars were taken out and put on a, a elevated uh, platform that I pulled up to the ovens. The ovens were like on the first floor, first uh, floor. So um, let me describe to you what happens when I, when people. I hate to use the word transport, mm -hmm. and I hate to use the word work on my own group. Mm -hmm. I just can't find. I, I, I just can't can get out to say the word work in, in the situation that I was. It's very hard for me. I didn't work. I, anyway, uh, uh, so let's say the, the, the uh, unload, uh, when people came, uh, the transport, uh, transport, you transport animals. Uh, and that's what they did. They transport us, us like animals, really. When it came in, that unloading ramp was away from the crematoriums. And so th they had to take him on trucks and bring him there. Yes. Right. Now, this is important now, I'm going to say. They, later on, they built the ramp, which was far away. They built it close to the crematoriums. Yes. So they didn't have to use any trucks when the people came and they saw a chimney, uh, they thought maybe it's a factory or something. Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually from the, from the other one, I'm going to go back to the unloading there, the first day unloading. And they brought, as soon as they took, let's say, three, four trucks brought in, the people got undressed. And they told the people to uh, uh, hang up their clothes. When they come out, they should find their, 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 you know, when they were undressed already, especially men, women, everything gets undressed. They felt it's something uh, not right there. Uh, I have two, I have incidents which stays in my mind. It came the rabbi from Sosnovitz, I think, with his people. Now, we had a problem, a, a fight of conscience, anyway, I don't know if it's conscience, to tell the people that they're going to die or not to tell. You to didn't talk to, to them at all? To the no, we were not allowed to, but you, you, you can... Uh, you didn't know to tell them that they're going to die, to give them more uh, uh, pain. Uh, who knows? We didn't know ourselves. But I'm going to describe you one incident that uh, Rabbi with his people came, and I see that they they felt being undressed with the woman and everybody together. They felt it's something wrong. And I told him that time that they're going to die. 
which I think the first time I did, and, and I, I didn't think I ever told anybody else. They said, Vira, they drank Luchan, the whiskey, I think. That's the, the way of the vodka. vodka. And, and I grabbed the bottle from them and I drank it with them together that time. They knew, that group knew that they're going to death. They were from Poland too? Or from Sosnowicz, yes. From Poland. yes. Now, another thing is that children reacted. Uh, they had a certain sense of fear more than the grown ups. Maybe a grown up can reason a child that more of, uh, reacted more right away. And they, when they were in dress, they weren't as nice to them as, as before talking to them, the Germans. And uh, one kid jumped on me, and I still feel it, and this is how many years. He jumped on me and he says, let me be the last minutes with the Jew. And I remember that kid and I remember the word they 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 just never get out of my mind. Now this system was going on. When this child jumped on you, what was your task? I mean why did you stand there? To, you had to you see had to that they get undressed. To be undressed. Yes. Like yeah. It's yeah. the same testimony. That the same to get undressed. Yes. Now once what happened and this was in the crematorium one like I explained, the the the, uh, run, uh, the unloading ramp was away, and they brought some people with American passports. A group, a few hundred people with American passports. Now the first group came. They had all their jewelry. And w with furs, dressed beautifully. That time, I don't know if it's right. They came from Bergen Bells in a special, a special uh, uh, camp, or some ways they came from a special camp that they was kept. Mm -hmm. And they brought them in, and they had some trouble on the unloading ramp. Mm -hmm. It seems that this type of people when they started the same approach like they used to do with hitting and knocking and all kind of things. Mm, they schnell, schnell, right? huh? Shouting. And Shouting. Right? They felt it's something wrong possible and they gave them a resistance there by the unloading. So, and the peop so they start bringing in, the, usually they had two, three trucks until they got undressed, they brought the other, right? So one didn't see what the way the other went. And uh, this group, they had trouble there, so they started bringing as as fast as possible from the ramp there. And they packed in that few hundred people in that big hall, and they didn't want to dress. Uh, the big brass came, I don't know who was there, possible mall or the head of the camp. They came there and one woman, I would say a beautiful woman, was uh, undressed completely and she had her uh, panties in her hands and she smacked the high officer, the uh, SS officer. And I was told to take it away, you know, to take it away. And if they knew that time what I was saying to her, I passed by, I would got the bullet right away. I said, in Polish, I say, that's mean, go away, don't be afraid. That's it, literally translation from it. And she was the, uh, 
the spark of the whole thing. Soon as she hit them with the uh, underwear, they ripped down the lights from the ceiling. They, they uh, uh, wrestled with the SS and they shot him with his own gun. And the, the, the whole room became dark. And that time we, we told them that uh, it's the end. You know, when they, they pulled us out, the prisoners, from the group. And they brought down floodlights. The whole thing was dark. They didn't address. They brought down floodlights and they put it at the door. And they brought one truck after another with SS. They ran down like on a battlefront. They ran down. And they killed the people in the clothing. They, they didn't undress them. They didn't undress. They killed them in the clothing. They were going around and looking if anybody's alive and, and, and kill them. This was the... It was a transport from where? Well. Uh, what I heard it was around Bergen Belsen they had a camp and this was people with all passports, United States passports. I don't know what way, maybe that's why in the beginning they kept them. But they brought them to crematoriums with their furs, with their jewelry. We never saw anything before like that. When was it in a box? Like I wouldn't remember. 44? 44 was the Hungarian uh, transports. So this was it's still 43? 44. No, um, this is still, the ramp was built. The ramp was built. This was possible in the beginning of 44, right? I suppose. Um, okay. And, uh, this is the fact what I remember distinctly what happened. It was also some episode or some moment that uh, some of the victims talk to you or ask you, you, the people who were there, some questions or something. Uh, like I said before, right? We were uh, uh, we we were torturing ourselves to or to tell the people or not to tell the people. But did they ask you? Mm, I didn't have the approach you or ask you. No, I didn't have the experience uh, really from it. Maybe some people did. What happened? Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I want to go to, uh, no, uh, I want to go of the planning of the uprising, to make it a little, the, the... No, it's, it's far, I mean, I think before, I want, I want you to tell me things before this. Yes. It's already in the end of 44, it's October 44. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you some questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what was your routine life, I mean, uh, after you have a shift or something, you talked with your people, you have some company or... What did you fill your days with, or nights, or what was the hours of the working? Uh, after, you mean? No, in the Zondo Commando. Yeah, but I mean the work, the working. You, say you working. start working in, like you described me, a day in this work. Uh, if they, if they uh, didn't have the transport, we did all kind of things around the crematoriums, you know. All kind of manual things were was there. In the time, like you know, who knows, cleaning other things, uh, you know. Uh, another thing, I worked as a watchmaker in the crematoriums. Mm -hmm. uh, when the times uh, was no, uh, they didn't uh, bring people from, from uh, you know, if they didn't bring 
the it people. It was times that they didn't use the gamatorium, they didn't mm -hmm. use the gas chambers, and what, when? What? They didn't use it? Or? No, if they didn't have the people, they, they, they didn't use the gas chamber. For what reason? I mean... Uh, Yes, uh, I understand, but in '44, for example, it's known that it was very oh, yes, sure. massive destruction of Hamichtung. Uh, right, and now another point. Uh, if they caught an individual person hiding somewhere, they didn't, a Jew, and they brought him to Auschwitz, uh, they didn't wait to get him together for a, pr a transport. They brought him in uh, and he was shot. Yes. Uh, um, what I remember is, uh, uh, I was, if other people, mm -hmm. if other people were, were away, let's say, and I was always in, in days like that, sitting and repairing watches. I had a room which wasn't legal. If any big shot came, I had to get out from there. They, they, they didn't have their mechanics, so I, I they brought work from all kind of places. They, they, they assess and they, uh, so I was, if the other group, uh, the rest of the group were somewhere else, I didn't even know where it was, when there was no uh, uh, transport. transport. And uh, you, when I, so when I was there, I was called in, let's say once, uh, they brought a, a Jewish woman with a child. And the first thing, they uh, killed the child, mother holding it. And I, I asked the question, if anybody can describe the thoughts of the mother, mm -hmm. seeing the child being, being killed first. Mm -hmm. what they, and, and they killed it with a very um, sport-like uh, uh, shotgun, like, like uh, in the shooting galleries you have. They they put it behind, behind the here about the neck, and they, and came out this way. Mm. So uh, it killed constantly, uh, instantly. I mean, and and later they they had uh, a special room that the doctors did uh, experiments. Uh, that room was uh, full of jars with uh, human brains, mostly parts. They you were know, your work is in Zondel Command. Uh -huh. I mean, you went out from the Zondel Command area to see things. No, like this the, is in the crematorium. Uh, this was near the crematorium. In the so? crematorium. Uh, in the crematorium. Special rooms. Uh -huh. Right, uh -huh. where the doc doctors came and, uh, and they did all kind of experiments. Mm -hmm. They they experiments with injections, uh, with poison injections, and they watched how long it takes to die for Penorium. the person. Hmm? Penol, it's called. Yeah. Penol. Anyway, they shot in the eyes and the other places of the human body to see how how fast the person dies. Mm -hmm. And that room uh, was a terrible, a terrible room. Uh, uh, twins, they wanted to know. A lot of twins, kids, mm -hmm. they wanted to know what makes them. Um, mm -hmm. And. But you, you have some uh, connection with the other con Zondag I mean, you talked about the work, or you talked about how do you feel, or how do you think after no, the work, or something, where you went to sleep, or something like this. Uh, I was really uh, locked up. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can say that uh, my trade helped me a lot. I I got a certain respect from the from the from the I don't know if it's respect or they need me who knows uh, which uh, uh, I'll give you an example uh, in the block the couple uh, I never did anything for you I never gave anything to the man and he respect me. In a certain way. Who was the couple? Couple was a French. Uh, he had a, a, a triangle, a red triangle, 
to their interpretation, to the German interpretation, uh, was a criminal. Red, Red. communist. Red. Communist, maybe. I don't know. Green, green. Is. A green was a criminal. He, he had a red triangle. Uh, uh, but he did me once a favor too. Uh, this was already. I don't want to jump the thing. Uh, uh, Never mind, you go on. It's okay. The, we did a lot of writing, uh, describing the transports of the people, and uh, uh, including some family pictures. Uh, I mean, you can hold, uh, get things like this, or hold yes, things. Yes, like you, you were at the clothes, clothing. Mm -hmm. You were at the clothing. Mm -hmm. People just carry it with, with them, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, was people now a group that uh, did the writing, like I just came through here. Uh, uh, Zaman Gradovsky, they were found they, they are in the archives, they are here. Yes. Yeah, but I didn't want to take it and read it before I tell my own story. I, don't want, I didn't want to be influenced with anything what he had to say. But he, he was a, a journalist before the war, and uh, he wrote a lot, he described the transports uh, from where they come, and we included some f pictures, family pictures, what we found. And uh, I know one metal can, that metal can was the can that they used to take out the ashes from the ovens. Yes. So uh, one metal can was packed with old material, and uh, let us uh, information was included there and written in a few languages. I know it was addressed to Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, and the Gaul. So it was all the languages yes. was written there, and it was sealed with cement. Mm -hmm. And this was buried. Well, I still see the place where it was buried, but I don't think if it was found. Or, I never went back to Poland after that. So I don't know, but uh, I, I buried the, the uh, plan of the crematorium that the, it was somebody drew all the locations and everything, where it was and what and when. And um, like I said, I had a little time, so a lot of times, uh, that most of them were away or something. I had time. So in a certain occasions, I, I did. Uh, maybe once or twice, but the other ones did constantly. The things what you have here from Zaman Gradovsky was found there, mm -hmm. and, and you have in the archives. It's written, handwritten in, in, uh, in Yiddish. You have some connections with him, I mean? Uh, no, no, but uh, I know uh, who he is, and I know that he was writing, and uh, 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 sometimes I helped and a lot of people uh, you don't know what they were doing you know everybody uh, did something uh, uh, what's possible uh, what about food you have better food than other prisoners in the camp i will say so yes mm -hmm. yeah um, it's a little personal stories that i shared mine uh, I will tell you something. Uh, I sh helped like three sisters from my town. Huh. Uh, they're alive. And uh, in uh, Miami, in Florida, I was invited for uh, uh, to come to uh, somebody at dinner from my town and made it. And I came into that apartment and one of the sisters was there. And she runs over to me and she says, thanks to him I'm alive. Mm -hmm. And I say, who should I think that I'm alive? 
I did what it's, I felt that I, I should do, but I can. You can tell us what happened mm -hmm. in the war, uh, in this in this episode. That you, how did you save this? Uh, how I know I, I had a chance of uh, sending uh, some clothing, some food. It was always a group from our uh, uh, oh. group that they were going into the women's camp mm -hmm. to bring in certain things like mm, discarded clothes, all kind of thing to burn. So with a hand wagon and other things, when I knew that they're going, so under the the shmatis, you know, under the clothing, that discarded clothing, uh, I, I, I always managed to send them something. And it was a, any little thing meant a lot. A cigarette you could have buy uh, uh, eight potatoes, and and uh, uh, a lot of times they they didn't gave us, but they, they I think the Red Cross uh, uh, gave like additional a uh, tulaga uh, they call this additional food, maybe once a month or something like it, uh, um, uh, with some cigarettes which I didn't smoke. Um, I used to, uh, let's say they gave a piece of salami and two cigarettes, right? For addition or something. I think this was the Red Cross, but they seldom gave us. And so for the one cigarette, I bought another piece of salami, you know. And sometimes I had a, a French uh, girl, which is a personal story, I hope. Before I get up from this world, I hope that I can see that it's a kid. I'm getting off the subject from talking. But uh, she came across, we were going out from the camp in the morning, and she came opposite me, and I threw over something to her, walking straight, and I threw. And she learned to catch it. And uh, I got a letter, she threw a letter to me. You have to realize that the, we walked with assassin dogs, and 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 they they group also the same thing. And she wrote me a letter in French that only a Frenchman can do that. Uh, uh, what I'm doing, and now I told her that I wrote back that time through a letter back that I'm from Poland. It doesn't make a difference, but the end of it, that she one morning she ran out from her group. And they ran over to me and gave me a kiss, and nobody saw it from the SS. Mm -hmm. it, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We were watched, and both groups we were watched. And that kiss I felt maybe for 20 years. And I was looking, you say about helping, right? You see, mm -hmm. but, but I, uh, she had such a resemblance of my little sister. I knew that she wasn't alive. But that triggered the thing to single her out. And she wrote me the story how she came. She came with her father from Lyons, 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 uh, France. Mm -hmm. They came the time when the Warsaw Ghetto was this destroyed April already. 43. Yes, that's the time he came with her. And um, she, uh, they took him to Warsaw, to Warsaw, to clean to clean up there, and she landed. And she got sick, and she landed in the in the sick in the Krankenhaus, the barracks. And every morning, in every or a man's uh, camp or, or or in the woman's camp, every morning was an inspection. Anybody sick? It's no yes. sickness. He had he went to the crematorium, and they were hiding her every morning. That kid. So she wrote to me that they were hiding me, and now she came out, and here I come and help her. She doesn't know what to contribute, but I'm just showing you uh, that that uh, uh, little thing of humanity, little thing of uh, that was. I, I never I never died out. I always I saw the worst thing happen uh, uh, with people. Uh, uh, I can't figure out. I never lost it. And, I, and, and another thing, uh, the, uh, when they 
bombed Kern, Cologne, right? The Amer one of the SS what guarded us it was from Cologne. I didn't know why he picked me to talk. He said to me, possible I had more time than somebody else. He sa says to me, when I come home, I, I just, when I hold my child on my knee, I see all the doubts, their children. That's what the, the German assess. And I was always wondering why did he pick me to talk. The next day, we found out the, the civilian, when they came in to work from the outside, they wrapped the sandwiches in, in, uh, uh, in paper, newspaper. That's how we got some information from the outside. So the information was that they were, they bombed Cologne, Kern. And that's possible triggered him to talk to me. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can figure out. Mm, so, the, the allies, they are Yes, yeah, the yeah. But where did he, why, but the question is, why did he pick me? So, uh, the only the only thing I'm not trying again to to uh, get my uh, uh, myself put in another picture or other things. My behavior was from the beginning to the end. I I I kept myself with a a little dignity, a little dignity. They took away plenty. And and if the only thing I can say from all the experiences, oh. If a person is left with a little dignity, a little bit, has a better chance of he had a better chance of survival, if if it's possible. It was it was so important not to see the animal point of the human being. The 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 father took away this bread from the son. The son took away the bread from the father. It's uh, unbelievable to go in, in a latrine and, uh, and uh, uh, to sit down with uh, 15 people in one row. No closing or anything. You close yourself up and you, and you go uh, to take care of your duties if it was possible. But all the things are downgrading of the human being. And, and if you're able to keep yourself a little bit, uh, you are all right. Now, all right, I don't know all right what it means, but it helps. Um, with all the talking, I'd like to come back to the point when we started organizing for the uprising. There's huh? still some questions. Uh, did you notice or you were a witness of this uh, the, the Germans or maybe also Zondo Commando people were drinking a lot, or the Germans especially just to exist in these jobs that they have with death and killing and all I, that. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't know if somebody found something to drink and drank, uh, okay, but the organized drinking, I don't think so. Organized drinking, you're talking, like like it a, is known that like it a was daily a, daily. A really, uh, in the, not an industry, but it was a market of vodka in this zone. Yes, it, it, it was a it was a the, from the civilians that they, they brought in. Uh, I tell you, especially uh, the Germans who have to work there, they drink it. They didn't give it to you. Mm -hmm. No, I ask if you saw if, if it exists. Uh, it was uh, a lot of times, yes. Uh, but sure, uh, uh, it's hard hard to say. Uh, I know on the, on the places where I slept, I didn't see it. It could be other places it was going on, all the things. And... Uh, it was uh, plenty of occasions uh, to have it. Uh, but uh, organized, like organized daily drinking, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say so. For the purpose, 
It was just that if somebody was able to get something, you know, you have to realize that that in, in any place in a in a, in, a, in a, uh, most of even in, is a is a market for for certain things. Thousands of people came in. No, I'm not judging. Just no, no, I'm not the question of judging. But the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. by itself, it creates. Yes. It creates by itself. You don't have to organize it. Uh, uh, who knows who got my stuff, what I brought. And the people that work uh, at the clothing, people are working in all kinds of places. Uh, we <laughs> were not allowed to touch anything. Yes. And uh, and I'm sure, and I wouldn't say if they did that's wrong or, or right or other things. Uh, everybody was uh, they took away everybody's and 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 they, they took the the gold teeth and they shipped it to Germany from the dead ones. They had a special box that all the jewelry that was collected from from the people was put in a locked up box and uh, this was, was uh, empty it and send it away where did it go it went to them so i would say that anybody had the right to take it mm -hmm. i'm just trying to know the facts and uh, list uh, to say who have the right or not it's no not i'm just what no really i'm just saying then. if you if you if okay. you uh, if you look back uh, thinking about it, uh, you know, uh, uh, you didn't think that way at that time, the way you think now. Yes. It's a, it's a no, different... No, I just ask you what you saw, not... Uh... No, personally, I didn't see organized drinking. If possible, that uh, they had some something to drink as a possibility, yes. Mm -hmm. But nobody, the Germans didn't give anything. No, this is, this is, a, this is not... A, Never happened. You talked once with the Germans? No. About what happened then? Absolutely. I, I no. Say, I mean that was the only incident that I had, and I was wondering uh, why all of a sudden he started talking. And, uh, and first thing I, I said to myself, why did he pick me? I, I wasn't like anybody else. And with the Greek prisoners, you have some connections? No, but uh, in the time of the uprising, I was placed ahead of the Greek group. Mm -hmm. During your work as a Zondo commander, you were sleeping in a room alone or with other people, or how? We were uh, uh, a lot of times sleeping, it was sleeping quarters in the crematoriums also. But there was a special barrack in the camps. Mm -hmm. But it's that in the same we, we went back and forth. Uh -huh. Far from the camp at all? Yes. Yeah, like, like the camp was. Uh, I don't know how far you start mm -hmm. measuring. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, yes, how much did you wait at the liberation? Who knew what weight they had? No, because it's known no. from the Zondo Commando people that they were living very near the crematorium, but they, they were not allowed to go out. No, no, it, it's in the same camp, like anybody else, mm -hmm. except it was a locked block, you couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and if at the time they uh, brought in some, uh, uh, like the, in the time of the Hungarian uh, Transport. transports, we slept in the crematoriums upstairs. They had a special mm -hmm. sleeping. Uh, yes, I wanted thing. to ask you about this time of August or the summer of '44, where Lodge Ghetto or the Hungarian transport came to Auschwitz Birkenau. If you remember, I mean, specific or episode of things that happened. No, it was just a human wave of, of people. Constantly. What was your job then? I mean, hmm? What did you do then, this time? The same. Uh, a lot of times, uh, frankly speaking, I got out of it uh, with uh, being with my trade uh, as a watchmaker. As a watchmaker, uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot of times they. But uh, even the other group didn't like it. 
that they are not going there, you know, like figure like anybody else, I'm the same. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times they save me some trouble of being there. Uh, the German couple, especially that uh, one, the mechanic. What was his name? I don't know. They finished him up. Mm -hmm. I don't know for what reason. All of a sudden, he, he, he was dead. Now, uh, who, who killed him? The Germans? The Germans, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the head of the couple from the uh, our group was killed also, Kaminsky. Mm -hmm. It was taken out in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. This was uh, after the failure of the organized uprising. Later on, it happened that there was an uprising, but the preparation of the uprising, which it was a plan. Uh, you want to ask me other questions, or no, shall can, I start? You can start. Yeah. It was people in every camp that mm -hmm. worked. Uh, the headquarters of it was in Crematorium One. It was a committee of it, and we were watched constantly. You couldn't group together. But the reason how the way they got away with it is uh, it was uh, sitting in a room at the table and an open door, the door was open and make believe that you're playing cards and all cards and all the planning was done talking that way. You will belong to what kind of toy? Uh, two, right opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, the preparation was there. The, the uh, woman, the women's groups that worked at the ammunition factories, uh, they were cutting in the, in their organs. They were cutting in the, the powder. And uh, it was one uh, uh, woman that took care. She was. They knew where it, who to give. She took care on it. And it was. Thrown over to our the uh, the adjacent the woman camp was adjacent to crematorium one. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry for the question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Only what you saw. Yes. You know what I mean. Right. Because it's a very problematic subject. All this. No, 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 no. That's okay. what I said in the beginning. I said I anything what I'm telling you is the truth. That's that's holy to me, and that's what I said. Right. Okay. And that's that's for the truth, and, and I don't allow the women from Union. Hmm? You you when you talk talk about the women, you you mean the women from Union factory? I don't know what factory. I know that the the uh, crematorium one was adjacent with electric wire and everything with the women factory. Uh -huh. uh, I mean with the women uh, camp, camp. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and this was thrown over. The, uh, a lot of times over the fence during the day or something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with that wagon going in for the old clothes to take out, you know, to burn it, it was smuggled out too, a lot of times. Now once what happened, that uh, uh, it was thrown over, over a package and the commandant that I think Maul was his name, on a motorcycle, passed by, and uh, he noticed that something was thrown over from the uh, a woman's camp. You mean he noticed? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he came in, and he asked for the package. What can they say? They said there was a cake, and they finished it. Uh, and let him lie down on the on the ground, and he stepped with his boots on on on, on the on the people, and eventually he gave up. But this was a package which was thrown over from the women's camp to the side. Now the preparation was there is with knives, sharpened knives. The powder was put in in, in metal containers. You know, special preparation for larger 
uh, pile the, the boxes to be put in, in the ovens in the time to uh, uh, explode them. This is the side of preparation. From it, it came in, it was bought really with the things from the crematorium things. Yes. yes, from the what is possible. The civilians what came in from outside work, they brought these knives and other things. And was a question of guns also. I tell you why. I'm going to tell you later uh, uh, the incident of it. Anyway, the the things were hidden. The the crematorium had a, a uh, where the top uh, lodging was we were sleeping, and the, and the outside uh, the the roof was going down at the angle, and it was the uh, what do you call that uh, that you make the roofs uh, the tiles Bricks. not tiles bricks no. No, shingles, mm -hmm. the, the uh, red shingles. Mm -hmm. we, we took out the, some red shingles and we dropped it between the wall. Yes. Between the wall and, and uh, there's no other way accessible except there was a space between the wall and, the, and that uh, outside. So the thing was dropped from the shingles on the outside and that's where the things were hidden and crematorium one and in crematorium two, exactly in the same place. Now, um, the couple, Kaminsky, we weren't allowed to go without a guard any place. But I would say that he did help the group a lot of times. But it's a certain personality that he possible bragged a lot or he was felt himself like the master of whom you know the couple and uh, he wanted it to, I knew that he was asking that he wanted to have a gun he felt you know and the committee never gave it to him now the plan so this is the preparation with the knives and the powder and the other things. So anything was able to buy from the civilians was bought. Mm -hmm. The plan was when the guard comes in, first thing to eliminate the guard, what is during the day. About five o'clock, the guards were changing. They put the a whole day the guards around the camp were never there. But after they pulled back the people from work from the outside, when everybody was inside the camps, that's the time they put the guards around the camp. Mm -hmm. So the time we supposed to finish up the guard, the assess what is with us, and take away the gun and everything so you have something already and preparation for the other that comes to change to do the same thing. And later on from, from both crematoriums, right? And from the other ones too. The, that's what the plan was. And going out from the crematorium, like I explained before, it was a road and on the other side was crematorium too. This is crematorium one, and this is crematorium mm -hmm. two. In the middle is the road. The guard came in the changing time, about 4.30 or 5 o'clock, I don't remember. Now, we supposed, after we acquired the redis from the SS that we killed, we acquired some uh, rifles or guns, what they had, and we supposed to go out from the crematoriums, and go on the road and divide ourselves, one row on this side, one row on this side. And when they came, the guard came, the, the changing guard, which is about, I would say about 15 or 20 SS. 
we're supposed to jump on them when they are surrounded with us. We're supposed to jump at them, fight with them, take away the the guns and everything. Now, the the committees in, in the camp. This this is the outside of the camp, right? The crematoriums. The committees in the camp had a plan. Uh, the signal of the plan. I'm going to tell you the starting of the plan was where they were uh, and lousing, where they are uh, cleaning the clothes, not uh, and lousing they call this. Disinfection. Disinfection. The mm -hmm. big barrels, uh, steam barrels. Mm -hmm. That supposed to be an explosion there, and this is a loud explosion. Mm -hmm. This supposed to be the sound of every group to start. Now the time was designated, the time when every group is on the road, finished working, that everything is outside the camp, on the road to, to the camp. And the, uh, the people in, in the camp was organized to cut the wires. One group supposed to make believe go out and, and uh, report to the uh, guard near the entrance of the camp that they're going out to work and they threw in some hand grenades which was made and overpowered them and take the uh, rifles or, or guns away from them. Now this was all the plans from, from the side where I know. And every crematorium had the same thing but the starting point supposed to be the explosion of the uh, drums and I think by 3 30 or 4 o'clock was the time when everybody was going back every group was on their way back from f to the camp and that's the time supposed to start it the outside population of the camp like Auschwitz they didn't want to know anything about it every camp Every group in the camp, and I think what I know, it was a, a Russian prisoner, a general, which they didn't know that he was a general, that he was in communication with the committee also. They all agreed, but the outside town of Auschwitz didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, we were in the point that you are describing the preparation from the uprising in yes. Birkenau in... Uh, October 44. Right. Now, uh, we decided on the day the uprising should happen, sh should come out. I was assigned to be the head of a, a, a Greek uh, a group, the Greek, uh, Greek prisoners. prisoners. Right. Yes. <coughs> and the day before it happened, uh, we had to tell everybody. Uh, what happened that time, uh, frankly speaking, uh, some uh, from the shack, uh, they had diarrhea. Some took it straight, what happened, and uh, some just got diarrhea from it, from, from, the, from what is going to, you know, it's, a, it's a, a reaction, a human reaction. I don't know if that's right to say it anyway. The day was supposed to be next day, it was supposed to be, and everybody had to be told. And everything was prepared for it. And like I said before, the ramp they brought in close to the crematoriums. And that day in the morning came in a transport from Poland, from Warsaw. They, they had some trouble, I think, in, in uh, uh, 44, they had something with the Polish population, they had some trouble there. Mm -hmm. And they brought in, have, I think in August, August. The uprising in the Warsaw. Yes. Of the Polish underground. Right. So they brought in, uh, uh, that transport came in with a few hundred uh, Poles and maybe about 200 SS. On the, on the right, on the spot that we supposed to start, really, the next day, the same day, really. 
we saw our ad, um, odds against us. We weren't prepared for this type of things. Now came the question, this was in the morning, how do you notify everybody that it's, the day is cancelled? From our group, uh, the only one that you can make an excuse and take the assess and go someplace was the couple. He can say that he needs to go somewhere there. And what he wanted <coughs> to notify first is the drums mm -hmm. that not not to start. We succeeded. We succeeded in a way not to start that day. Now we thought that everybody knew already that the Germans would get to know about it. But uh, uh, in a way uh, it seems that uh, they didn't. I couldn't figure out. But one thing happened after that. The night when they are, when they guessed, the the the, the it was a, a camp of gypsies. Um, they had some gypsies in the German army, officers. And they brought them, pulled them back from the from the uh, front. They pulled them back, and they put them in the camps. And that they decided to liquidate that uh, uh, gypsy camp and this was done in the small crematoriums three and four which was a, a I don't know how far I was away but uh, I, I was never there but I know it was in the vicinity maybe of uh, uh, 200 meters or 300 meters, something like it, from, from the big ones. And that night, when the, the gypsies, uh, uh, when they took the Germans, decided to liquidate the, the, the gypsies, they came and they asked the couple, Kaminsky, to come with them that they need some help there. And on the way, they put a bullet in him. They killed him. Mm -hmm. So after they <coughs> killed him, we thought that maybe they know something about it, about the preparation of the uprising. But I, I would say that he brought it himself, that he bragged a little bit too much. And I think so that's what it was possible. In some ways, he, he spoke about something. And later on, it came back that they, he felt that, uh, that he is the macher, you know, that he, 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 something happened. But after they killed him that night, we were afraid that the Germans got to know about it. But it, it seems that they didn't. Now, the thing was already brewing in us. Um, after what happened, now we and and two was all, we were organized to watch number one. If anything would happen, let's say in the time when something happened to start, we have to watch for anything from number one. What goes on? Crematorium number. Crematorium number one. <coughs> Now, we saw smoke coming from the small crematoriums. But uh, uh, in the beginning, we didn't know much what was going on there. Now, they, they killed some Germans. They put it on fire. And we saw that the, 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 the trucks of, 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 of the SS uh, going in that direction. Now, we realized that what was going on there. Now, we were waiting for number one to get a signal. What, are, what goes on, right? 
we we watched we watched and we didn't say anything in the meantime what happened number one they killed a German they they uh, uh, burned the, the body but and the whole thing what happened is behind the building they ran behind it's it's a, it was a large building everything happened behind the building they cut the wires and and they ran out <coughs> um, and we were looking for, for something that goes on and we didn't see anything now they they opened up the the hiding of the of the uh, things that we had the knives and the and the guns and the, I don't know if it was guns there I don't know the knives and powder was there possible individual guns was there too but uh, after they didn't succeed much they ran uh, maybe uh, uh, two kilometers or something and they brought them all back. Uh, they were shot there. So about 200 of the crematorium one, they were killed that time. But the thing is that from two, you were looking for any sign, and we didn't see a thing. Everything was behind the building going on there. Now, after that thing quiet down, they took us out. The, the Germans, they count us. And they see nobody's missing. So their interpretation was that we were not involved in the thing. So now the thing what happened, they saw on, on three and four that it's some trouble and they started on one. And we looked for signs and we didn't see anything. What uh, was going on in three and four, we couldn't see it. But it seems that they, uh, knew something or, uh, and, uh, and they started it and after uh, after they came over to us they count us and they see that nobody is missing so they they had the interpretation that we were not involved so we went over so they uh, we went over to the other side and see what happened and we take a look that the wall was broken down where the things, the knives and the powder was hidden. And they found in the ashes, they found the buckle of the German soldier, what was burned. Mm -hmm. So the only thing they found in the ashes, they were looking. <coughs> so they found in the ashes the buckle of, of a Now, I don't know, they, I, we were sure that they're going to come over and break the walls and ours and see if we have something there too. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems I didn't think that way. Mm -hmm. So when everything quiet down, we decided we have to get rid of the, of the things there. And if they decide to look at it, we're going to be finished also. So everything quiet down and we watched the guard ours uh, watched him and uh, he lay down and fell asleep. And that's the time the walls were made of pressed wood like from shavings from wood. The Germans had a way of of mixing it with a little cement and making like uh, blocks of it and the inner walls were made of, of this type of material. So we took a large knife, we cut out, uh, we knew where the things uh, are laying, we cut out in the wall, we cut out uh, a hole, and we kept that piece, we pulled out everything from there, and we took the canisters with the black powder out, everything out. We put back that piece and painted over with white paint. It shouldn't be noticeable. And I went down 
to dispose of the powder. So uh, the was the the bedroom was uh, really for the SS used one and one that we could use. So one came with me and I emptied emptied the, the powder first and I gave him the cans, I say, you go. And uh, I start flushing down the powder. It didn't go down, it got stuck. Everything. The, the, the powder is laying there, right in the front. I rolled up my sleeve and I pushed in my hand as far as I could and that thing went down. Now, I, I said to, to the fellows, I said, the ones that come em emptying out the, the, you know, from the tank, the, in the back of the, uh, the human ex ex extreme, ex what do you call that, uh, human? Uh, you mean O-A-O-A-O-N-O? You know, that you relieve yourself, what do you call in English? Uh, I, I, I was, what everyone is doing. Yeah, okay, Coffee. yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, uh, ah, Lord, the I, uh, X, X, something. I can, mm -hmm. I, I just didn't come to me. Now, they usually pump it out. Mm -hmm. It comes a special truck and pumps it out. Now, what they're going to open up the back with two wooden doors, was it? And they'll see the black powder. Mm -hmm. I say, we have to put some sand on it or something, mm -hmm. you know, to cover up, which we did now. Yes. That night, they locked us up in the room. In one room, uh, maybe a room like this, they locked us all up. We had still uh, um, gasoline and other things prepared to put that thing on, on, on fire. You know, we, we still had the gasoline with us. The first night it was an air raid over there. It never happened before. Now, here we locked up. And we said, a lot of fellows said, let's put the whole thing on fire. So the the reason was the the other things we don't have already. Everything we disposed of it. We only left with the gasoline. That wouldn't be enough to succeed with anything. Uh, at that time, the, the crematoriums weren't working already for for quite a time. So we took it up to a vote to do it or not, and the reason was that we're not going to accomplish anything with it. And they decided, and they say we locked up, I say, so some fellows said, locked up doesn't mean nothing. You break it and you, you get out, that's all. And they decided not to uh, go ahead and now, uh, That's how the planning was for the uprising? No, this is the after the uprising. Yeah, this is after, yeah, this happened after the uprising. But I, I say I covered the planning of the uprising, which was prepared. And this happened after the planning, which it didn't, the planning didn't what, work out. What did you do for, what did you work after uh, the uprising? Nothing, nothing. What happened, what changes out? There's changes in this. Uh, they stopped. They stopped. They they stopped the uh, uh, transports completely. Yes. For for the crematoriums. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, went to the barracks and we kept us locked up. Constantly, we were locked. We weren't allowed to go out from the barracks. And uh, mingle with other groups. 
and we knew that the Russians are near Krakow. How did you know? We knew that time. They were talking about it. There were, uh, and when the order came to liquidate overnight, to liquidate the Birkenau, the camp, and that's what happened that how we got out from the commando, from the Sunder commando. They had a plan to finish us up in Auschwitz, they, in, in, the, in, the, in the barracks, in the camp, or take us someplace. They planned they had, but they already came so uh, uh, that uh, most of the uh, papers were found there and everything, you know. They had to leave overnight, nobody had to be in the camp overnight. That was the order. So we came in to directly to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, we weren't already as a group, so we dispersed and uh, we attached ourselves to a carpenter, carpenters or, 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 uh, or uh, construction builders or something to attach ourselves to this group. And from that time, they took us on a march. And this was a dead, they called us a dead march. I mean, from the uprising until January, you didn't do nothing. Uh, so long. The January, Four yeah, but uh, when they, they stopped uh, the uh, crematoriums, no, we didn't do much. Uh, and most of the time, we really, they kept us locked up. Went out to appeal or to yeah, sure, that's normal. Yeah, that's a Food. thing, and I really can recall uh, uh, if we did something but, but but we never went back to uh to this work to to there to the crematorium mm -hmm. now you can describe me now the evacuation the camps the evacuation of the camp the camps that came in order and they just decided to close us up and and uh, to close up the camp, and that's I tell you. What did they say to, we went to they gave you? Nothing. They already you? came that nobody should be left in Birkenau, in the camp. Mm -hmm. and they brought us to Auschwitz, and, and, and the same, I think the next day or the same night, I don't remember, everybody was uh, evacuated. So we started on the, on the march, and, uh, uh, and anybody... You got food or something? Hmm? You got food to the way or something? Food or something. Don't I think a bread. Somebody got mm -hmm. something like it. Uh, and anybody that uh, we walked, we walked for days, and that anybody uh, couldn't walk, it was shut. So uh, uh, in a in a long way of, of walking, uh, we saw plenty of bodies uh, thrown uh, all over the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, we came to a, a railroad stop, and they loaded us on completely open uh, wagons, like you you carry sand and bricks and other things. It was completely open. It's train or trucks? Huh? Train or trucks? Train. Train. Yes, mm -hmm. open open cars. I wanted to yes. say, yeah. And, uh, and we traveled the whole night, it was snowing. The snow uh, uh, from the edges of the, of the, of the car, the, we ate. And we had one blanket uh, to cover ourselves, and the bl blanket became so heavy from the snow that we threw it away. It was worse with the blanket. Because it was wet. Yes. Mm -hmm. In that situation, came, we came in I, uh, to Ostrava Moravska, I think it's called Ostrava. I know Ostrava Moravska in Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. and I can I can never forget that the, we stopped on the station and then over the overpass. <laughs> Uh, they start throwing down the sandwiches, 
they were going to work on the hour when we arrived, the people were going to work. And people even on the platforms that we, we were standing, they threw their sandwiches to us. But I remember distinctly that a German saw, shot one woman on the overpass. I saw her slumping, I still can see her like now. She fell to the ground for just throwing a piece of bread to us. Now, I feel like going back to that town and, and thank him for the little humanity that there was showing in such a dangerous time. I really, it's in my mind, if I succeed to go now to Czechoslovakia, I think I'm going to make my business to go to Ostrava Moravska and personally thank him for it, what I still remember. Now from there, they brought us in to uh, Mauthausen. <laughs> and Mauthausen, they designed torches that is unbelievable. Uh, hundreds of people. They packed in, in maybe in a, a little space of a hundred meters, a few hundred people. And we had to go down to a, a bed. Everything is unclosing and unclosing and beds, you know, to clean yourself for, for who knows for what. We had to walk down. So you push yourself already and you come to the entrance that you want to go down, they start beating you, so you're running away, so you're still at the end of it. And the outside is cold, snowing, it's an open, open place, it was. So uh, until you came ready to, the, to take the best, what they had uh, given, uh, given us, uh, you had to go through torture. And after you were finished from the beds, you were unlucky to go out first. You had to wait for the whole group naked in, 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 in January. I don't know. I, I, it's hard to understand like, uh, how, how we survived that thing. And for Mauthausen, I was a, a few days there and they sent us to Ebensee. Ebensee was a part of Mauthausen. It was a camp high in the Tyrol Mountains. It was so high that when it stopped raining, the village down there was dry and on the top was still drizzling. That's how high it was. To go down to work was easy, but I measured my strength when I go back, when I still able to walk up. So I figured the next day I will be all right, still all right. But once I felt that I'm not going to make it to walk back up the, the mountain. But I made it, I came in that night. The first time in all the years, my parents came, came in a dream. And I felt that nothing would happen to me. I felt so strong. I felt that nothing would happen to me. And next day we went to work. Now, the air raids start to be frequently there. The first one when it came it was just a breath of fresh air, like like a, a, a like a yaskuk, uh, you know, you don't know what Polish, like a, a, the first uh, birds in spring. Uh, what is it called in English anyway? The first the first, wind or the first flower. The first first birds and and they come in in, sp in spring. The little ones, the bird birds. Yes. Oh. So the airplanes gave me that that feeling that some hope is coming. Now, the Aries became a, a daily thing. 
So when the time when we came back from the tunnels, we worked there, yeah, let me say it. We worked in the, in the mountains, they made tunnels to put in the war production there. It was pretty hard, very hard work uh, to bring out the stones from the, from the blasting, uh, to, you know, bring them out on the outside. And until they cemented the, the tunnels, plenty of stones fell down and, and a lot of people got killed just, just from these falling stones. But later on when they cemented already, uh, well, the danger didn't come from there. <coughs> anyway, so always the, the air raid was in the time that we supposed to rest, the air raid came, always the same time. And they chased us out from the, to go to the tunnels. Not to go, to run to the tunnels. For our protection, they said. For our protection, but on the way, space, the, the, the SS spaced themselves, and they were hitting us, beating us. So we asked, what do you mean our protection? You want to finish us up, you know, as much as they can. They want to finish us up. They were beating us on the way of running and beating. Mm -hmm. And after it was over, finally we, we asked not to move us, that we want to stay, let the bombs drop, and it, let, we figure let's at least be killed from, from, from a British bomb or American bomb, instead be killed from them. But that didn't help. Uh, they kept us uh, uh, torturing every time it was a air raid, we had to run back to the tunnels. And uh, I want to bring you another point. Walking back from work and before the hill starts was a German construction company that did some work, some building around there. And every day, this, I can say that a systematic thing was it. Every day a young woman was sitting in the window and eating. And this was, this was torture. And on the day of the liberation, the first thing that I did is try to go down to see if that thing is in there still there. Now they, they, they ran away anyway. If I would find that person, I think with the strength what I was left in me, I think I would have choked it to death. This was a, a purpose. Sitting every time, if you sit in the window, you look out uh, and you want to see a, a prison is going through, okay. But sitting and eating in the time when we go back from work, this was a systematic thing in there. Now, I don't uh, think the Germans were so sensitive. I don't think they even think about it. Oh yes, that 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 uh, uh, it's yeah. not sensitivity. Yeah, it's a plan. That somehow. that horse giving the water, uh, uh, the man giving the water to the horse. Yes, that time. They don't care. I mean. It's about the same thing. It's it's about the same. Yeah. <clears throat> now. Uh, I want to tell you another point. Uh, in the tunnels, when they uh, find you leaning on the shovel, they kill you to death. And one day, later on I realized that this was about six weeks maybe before the liberation. I gave up. My feet were swollen, and I, I gave up. I say, it's enough. I threw away the shovel. Mm -hmm. I went out from the tunnel, mm -hmm. and I sat down. I say, what is going to be, it's going to be. I just don't care. And I saw a German coming, and I recognized him. That this, he was transferred with our group from Auschwitz, from Birkenau. He, he was a guard in our group, a sergeant. 
and I recognized him. So he came over and faces me and he says, Ulmacher, what are you doing here? And I showed him, I said, I can't work anymore. And I asked him, you have a piece of bread? And he says, I haven't got myself. First thing, I was afraid that he's going to recognize me from the group where I came out, from the Zonder Commando, and I figured that, uh, you know, we, we were dispersed. And here, he's coming alone. So uh, he says, I haven't got the bread myself. And he asked me, do you realize what will happen if somebody else will find you here? I said, I don't care. He said, get back to the tunnel. And that time, I can say that something happened to me. A break between, first thing, when I, I started crying. And um, what uh, meant to me is that the, the, the goodwill of my folks did it. No other force, no angel, schmangel, no other things. It came a break in me that I, I, I threw away the other beliefs completely. Uh, uh, Something happened to me there that I didn't cry for, for all the times. I didn't. Years, you mean? Yes. And you here. Be, you believe in God before or what? Yes, I was brought up in a religious environment. No, I but got in, the, until this moment, you still didn't. I, I, I broke. I believed in. Uh, uh, I believed that the, the goodwill that my folks especially the dream what I had before, before these happenings, that I felt I'm not going to pull through. And, and, and I dreamt about my parents and I became, I figured it's going to be all right before, before this happened. And when this happened and I went back to the tunnel, I cried. And I figured that was the breaking point for me to break with the whole believing. When it comes, when somebody starts talking about, I never discussed it with, with anybody. Some people went into the camps, non-believers, and they came out believers. And some people were believers and they came out non-believers. After that happening, now this, this is something, they ask me, how did you survive? Can I, anybody believe that? It's hard to believe. They ask me, how did you survive? I gave up. I gave up more than once. And, and may, you want to go to college, no? On May, on May, on May 5th. 1945, we were sitting and waiting for food. Who thinks about something else? The hunger was so big that you didn't think about anything else. The Germans were still there? No, and finally we noticed that the, the guards are not around. In the morning you wanted to have some food. Finally we noticed the guards were around and the screaming in the camps was going on. And I see a picture, it could have been me too. Three, they kept the sick ones without clothes in the barracks. And I see three, three naked skeletons walking together, holding each other. The, the, Maybe maybe the, the the feet like like was big matches striking matches. Mm. That's the way they looked. I don't know how I looked, but what I remember 
from them, and everybody was going towards the entrance. They said that a, that a tank is there. I came to the entrance, it's packed, and, 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 and everybody's, they start throwing uh, uh, candy, cigarettes, and some got crushed from it on the day of the liberation. And I tried to climb up the tank. Was the Americans? Yeah. I was pushed on. I climbed up. I hugged the soldier. He cried. I cried. I never thought that that thing will come to an end. Uh, and after that, I, I ran into the booth, what they used to count us every time by going out. And uh, uh, you, I hated that place. They found by counting. I don't want to go back again now. It's a liberation. I'm happy that it's true. But uh, you have to emphasize the small little things. If you you are cold, and if you put the uh, newspaper b behind your clothes, if they notice that, they beat you to death, just for that. So when they count it, they watch for this type of things. It's, it's sadist. It, they, they, they ask, this is, a, this is a, a, a educated people. They came down to the, to the guest chambers, in the crematoriums, and they look through the open window, I mean, to the glass in the door. They look like people choking and, and dying, and how long it takes them. All kind of brass officers came down every time and looking at it and smiling. This is, this is people that, that gave us, gave the world all kind of things, and they were able to do unhuman things like that. Uh, I, I hated that boot. I, I went in and I smashed with my bare hand, I smashed the glass in it. Something, I don't know. But uh, this was over. And I got some food somewhere. And I went back to the barracks and I heard some cannon shootings, you know, that the sounds from a cannon. They were shooting in the air. They brought in some food and I was lucky I didn't eat it. It was peas and pork. Fatal. And, and and they brought it in that and they were they couldn't control the crowd so they were shooting in the air. And I lay down that time and I fell asleep and I had a terrible dream that time. I saw the black smoke from the crematoriums when they coming down, hitting the grounds. <laughs> and uh, uh, something woke me up, uh, and uh, uh, this was an American tank went through the camp. And I woke up and I say, I'm glad I'm here, not there. And uh, they brought in some workers from the civilian and the uh, Germans to, to uh, clean up the camp, take care of the bodies, the dead bodies was left over. Yeah, another thing, Bef before in the tunnels, uh, they want to finish up the people in the tunnels. 
I forgot to mention that. Before the liberation. Before the liberation. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we got, uh, uh, somebody must have delivered that uh, information mm -hmm. at that time. Possible it could be from some German that they felt that the stand is coming. We got the, uh, the information that they, they had the commandant from the camp is going to get us together on the assembly place and make a speech. And he's going to say that he is responsible for the prisoners what he has. And the Allied bombers are coming here and he, he wants to account for every prisoner and he advises to go everybody to the tunnels and that information we got if he was going to ask you to go to the tunnels you should all say no they had a plan of dynamiting the whole thing which they had their ammunition and everything mm -hmm. now the truth happened that they got this together the speech did come and they asked us the same thing to go there and we all said no so uh, this was very close to, to the liberation and after the liberation I didn't want to stay in, in, in Germany this is Austria the first uh, um, first chance I had that's the time that the, the transportation of, of the of the Jewish prisoners, I say Jewish prisoners, everybody came to claim the, after the liberation, to claim their citizens. Mm -hmm. The Dutch came, took their people, the French came, they took their people, and the Poles who wants to go back to Poland, to all the, all the troubles what we had there. It, nobody asked for, say anything, and the lucky thing was, that the Jewish Brigade, the Palestine Jewish Brigade was in Europe that time. And this was a lucky thing for the Jewish people. They started organizing and grouping the people in camps. I came from uh, uh, Austria, I went into Italy. And in Italy I went to an UNRWA camp. And I figured I came to myself a little bit and I built it up myself and I figured I'm not going to sit in the camp and I went to Naples. In Naples, the, 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 uh, it was organized a kibbutz from the, uh, from the supported by the Jewish Brigade and uh, we started working there, helping any way as possible. Now. I got some work, special work, what we did, is the, the soldiers gave up certain rations, like chocolate, cookies, and other things. And we packed this in boxes. And when the, the uh, ships came close to Naples, they, what at that time they called the illegal ships, they, 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 took a, they took the thing away. And uh, I had the keys of uh, some uh, storage of gasoline also. You need it for the transportation of the trucks and everything, which uh, where I got it, I don't know, didn't question. I just had the keys in the middle of the night. I was awakening and to go there and, and uh, finally the British realized that the brigade is using the military uh, vehicles for transportation of the people and they gave an order that no civilians on, uh, on any military uh, truck. So at that time, um, through intervention of American uh, officer, we went to a lot that it was uh, uh, old, uh, old vehicles, discarded vehicles from the American Army. Mm -hmm. And we took out some uh, things and fixed it up. And 
so this is the type of work I did after the liberation. I, I felt I want to work against the forces that put us in there with all the things. And the same thing, with the, the British didn't open up, to the, the, the let the people in, they put them in camps and, and, and our Cyprus and other things, they put the people that came out from camps, they put them in, in camps. Uh, uh, that's the type of work I did. And finally, they came with a proposition to me that one of their men has to go back, he finished, he has to go to transit camp. And uh, I look like him, I have the height like him, my coloring is the same. If I want to take his place, I knew I'm going to do it. And I said yes the next day. As soon as I said yes, uh, I dispose of all my personal things. Any picture, anything, everything was taken away from me. Um, my brother was came to uh, Israel, to Palestine that time, 1943, with the children from, from Tehran, mm -hmm. from, from Russia to Tehran, from Tehran. So, and he knew Ivrit uh, from the Tarbut that he learned, so it was easy for him to adjust himself. So, uh, they promised me that they're going to give the personal things to my brother. You know when he got it? Maybe 10 years later. <laughs> that's Maybe okay. At least, huh? No, really. That, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. But uh, and now, uh, I, took, I took his play, I took, I decided to take Arias, and I didn't know that time his name, I decided to take his place. Now, I had a number on. Mm -hmm. uh, from the concentration, and he was born in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Yes, you told us about the number. Mm -hmm. The number was uh, it's fine, achtzig drei einundzwanzig. So uh, they looked around for for uh, somebody to make a, a flower of it, a tattoo of it, mm -hmm. and uh, they found somebody at the waterfront in Naples. Anyway, the company was five forty four. This was in 46 already? Uh, 46, yes. Mm -hmm. Right in 46. Mm -hmm. I came in August 46. I came to the United States. So, you, if, why I came to the United States, you're going to hear later on. I'll make it short. Okay, go on. So, uh, uh, he tried to make a flower of it, of the number. And uh, the way he explained it to me, I, I was afraid for, for uh, who knows what. Uh, how they do it, I said, cut it out. And they paid for it. I always feel guilty that I didn't pay back the money, what they gave, paid. It didn't work out, I want you to know. They paid for it, and I got the little number in a little bottle with alcohol, and I took it with me, and I was wearing a bandage for a, oh, I don't know, a week or something. And after they took off the bandage, they took me to a company and they started the drill, the English drill, you know. Mm. And, and being in the Polish army, I figure uh, I'll get used to it, it's different. But uh, uh, when they felt that I'm ready already to mix in with the others, they gave me the whole belongings. I got his book. I got this uh, tuffle bag with a rifle. And I learned who Arya Hakim is. Arya Hakim, how many sisters he had and how many brothers and what restaurants he ate and what military camps he was. And actually, what uh, job you have to do? I took his place. He's supposed to go back, and he was carrying on with the bricha. Mm -hmm. But what did you? What do you have to? I do took then? his place as a soldier, a but sol they only a soldier or something. No, o only a soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did a one smart thing when they transferred me to to Arya's company. Mm -hmm. They sent the electrician with me. Mm -hmm. I will be the electrician's helper. 
Yeah. So in the morning, I go out with the electrician and I helped him. So what happened? In the morning, the sergeant didn't know, nobody knew in the company who I am. My Yavrit sat uh, uh, before the war. I, I came in and I threw the towel back. And he asked me about what company, and I told him Yavrit, what company I came from. I gave him my towel back and I gave him my, my rifle. The only one new in the company is the officer, the, the high officer. You know, I still, I still see a nice looking young man, but I felt that time I betrayed him when it didn't work out, i tell you why. I was going on guard, getting paid as a regular uh, soldier, and uh, uh, my mail didn't come to the company. My mail came to a... a a family in, in uh, Naples, and a friend of mine used to go up to the soldiers' club and send the, the mail to me. And I answered, I had my uh, mother had uh, four or five sisters. She was the only one left in Europe. Everybody was in the United States. And they sent me telegrams with paid returned answers. And I answered every telegram that I'm going to Palestine. And every telegram, I answered that. And later on, when I came into that company and I didn't get the mail, so the mail was transferred. Uh, so I'll make it short. Some, the last telegrams, I got quite a few telegrams, and I answered that I'm going to Palestine. The last telegrams came that my brother from Israel is on the way to the United States. My brother that came in 1943, Avram. Avram. Mm. And this was not true. I was not true? No. I end of my did it for her personal reasons. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that Avram is on the way to the United States, I took all the telegrams and I went up to the soldiers club and I'm looking for the chavarim, what they put me in to this, you know, what I took. The, they all went back to Palestine. Palestine that time. And I went through what I did, the, the English doctor. Mm. It was maybe four days before the transit camp. And I come with a story like that, that I'm not going. So I didn't see anybody that I knew, but knew about it. Mm -hmm. But I saw one man on the balcony outside standing, and I figured that he knows about it. So I went over to him. I said, you know anything about me? And he says, yes. So I want to talk to you. So I tell him, and I don't say much, and I give him all the telegrams to read. In the last telegrams, he says, what are you showing me? I said, I can't go. What do you mean you can't go? I thought he's going to throw me off the balcony or he's going to jump off the balcony. He says, come up next day. And next day I came up, uh, the Hevra took me into a different room. And, uh, and he says, you know what you're doing? You're running away from the front line. I say, Hevra, you didn't talk me into work with you all the time. And you didn't have to say anything to me when you asked me to take his place. Uh, I wanted it. But now, I haven't got the strength already. Before, if they would have caught me, they wouldn't get anything out of me. How, where, and what. They could have clubbed me, I don't care how. They would never. But I'm not ready now. If I'm going to have trouble, you're going to have trouble. I said, I'm not ready for it now. So, we shook hands. And they took me to another company, and they gave me civilian clothes. And that order was that I couldn't go back with any military, especially with the Jewish Brigade. They couldn't use any for civilian clothes. So I passed by a truck with Polish soldiers, and they took me. And, and I went back to Naples, to Napoli, back to the kibbutz. And that's how I wound up 
1946 in August. And then you went also to the United States then? To the United States. Because you have their family and they gave you a fidelity? No, they, t they told me that my brother is on the way to the United States. But how could you get a fidelity to the United States? They sent me there. They you have me. a family there? Oh, sure. I told you, five and sisters my mother mm -hmm. had. And and, and uh, so they they cook the whole they cook rest? the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. Now uh, later on they asked me why did you go to Nice France? I said I didn't go to Nice France. We got a telegram. They said that I answered that you are in Nice France. Nice. Somebody somebody mm -hmm. cutting the mail mm -hmm. from Naples to me must have looked in to the telegrams. And it was a prepaid telegram, so they answered that I'm not in Italy, that mm -hmm. I'm in France. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe me that I didn't go to France, mm -hmm. but somebody sent sent the, the mail. But your brother went to Palestine then. But he was in Palestine up to now. He lives in Tehran. Uh -huh. He never went to that. State. No, my brother was in the Palmach and had an arm. It all would, you know. You mean your aunts want to save you? Or no, it was a personal reason. This is family things, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that time, no. Mm -hmm. I was really angry. And then you stayed there until today? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You want to add something? Because we have only <laughs> one more minute. Yeah, well, what is to add from all the experiences what we had? In the, old, in the humanity, what the Jewish people lived through, it's a half a century coming already after that, and we still have the same roots of it growing up. One thing we are lucky that we have a strong Israel, mm -hmm. and that's why Baudism too, and that's why possible the anti-Semitism is stronger. They know that the Jews are strong now. They wouldn't take it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they they uh, used to say we don't know. It's uh, after sixty minutes already. Okay. Thank you. Don't thank me. It's my obligation. Okay, the whole time.